Hello and welcome to the 16th episode of Planetos Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the fans of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire and HBO's A Game of Thrones. Spoiler warning, this show will cover all material, including the main series, the Duncan Egg stories, the novellas, Fire and Blood, the World of Ice and Fire, George's interviews and quotes, and all the episodes of the show and its commentaries and bonus material. I'm one of your hosts, Brett. You can find me on Twitter at Homely Pillow. And I'm your other host, Travis. You can find me at Sarah underscore Travis on Twitter. We hope you enjoy today's show. So today we're going to enter the paranoid and dark mind of Cersei Lannister. Cersei is a cruel and manipulative woman. She drinks too much. She uses and abuses those around her. She plots and schemes, and but in her mind, uh, she sees herself as a grand chess master. And through her terrible decisions, she unleashes chaos upon the realm. Nothing defines Cersei more than a prophecy given to her by a woods witch, which we first hear in A Feast for Crows. So let's start right there with the Maggie the Frog prophecy. Three questions you may ask, the crone said, once she had her drink. You will not like my answers. Ask or be gone with you. Go, the dreaming queen thought. Hold your tongue and flee. But the girl did not have sense enough to be afraid. When will I wed the prince, she asked. Never. You will wed the king. Beneath her golden curls, the girl's face wrinkled up in puzzlement. For years after, she took those words to mean that she would not marry Rhaegar until after his father Ares died. I will be queen, though, asked the younger her. Aye. Malice gleamed in Maggie's yellow eyes. Queen, you shall be, until there comes another, younger and more beautiful, to cast you down and take all that you hold dear. Anger flashed across the child's face. If she tries, I will have my brother kill her. Even then, she would not stop, willful child as she was. She still had one more question due her, one more glimpse into her life to come. Will the king and I have children, she asked. Oh, I, six and ten for him and three for you. That made no sense to Cersei. Her thumb was throbbing where she'd cut it and her blood was dripping on the carpet. How could that be, she wanted to ask, but she was done with her questions. The old woman was not done with her, however. Gold shall be their crowns and and gold their shrouds, she said. And when your tears have drowned you, the Valonqar shall wrap his hands around your pale white throat and choke the life from you. Now that prophecy, like Circe as a point of view, comes out of nowhere. Sure, we get Bits and pieces of it, small hints as we uh, read Cersei's chapters in A Feast for Crows. But here we are in Cersei 8, A Feast for Crows, and we finally get this dream sequence. It's a memory that comes rushing back to her. And it's not like Ned's fever dream in A Game of Thrones or Danny's visions in A Clash of Kings. No, this is the real thing, and you find out why Cersei is the way she is. Cersei has been warped for a long time by this prophecy, uh, one that she heard as a young girl, and she is driven by her growing anger and paranoia and narcissism throughout the series. However, we also see that she is tormented and abused by her past and many of the characters around her, especially men, including King Robert Baratheon. As George does so well, uh, your empathy kicks in and you begin to sympathize with her to an extent. Uh, You can still hate her, though. It's fine. Really, really it is. Um, But we're also going to explore today the collar gold, uh, which surrounds Cersei, defines her and House Lannister, and many of the characters who are either ambitious and greedy or who struggle for power from a well-intentioned position. It's really a powerful use of symbolism by George. But first, we have a very, very special guest today to discuss the Lion Queen and Golden Crowns and Golden Shrouds with us. Please welcome Josh uh, Michelli to the Planetos podcast. Josh, welcome. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm really excited to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. Um, we want to thank Josh for this episode. He is the uh, – uh, we've interacted him, with him on Twitter uh, for a while, 
Um, and when we asked him to join us, he had this great idea. Uh, so the idea really rests with you, and we thank you for it, and we thank you for your great input uh, on the script and, and where I think we're going to take people to a pretty fantastic uh, uh, discussion, uh, through a pretty fantastic <laughs> discussion here and, today. And I'm super excited about this topic. Cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, no, yeah. I was trying to think of something really that, like, you know, kind of, we could kind of attack it from a bunch of different sides. And I think that that's kind of fun because you got different people with different perspectives and, um, you know, they might approach it and they're very interested in like the thematics of the books or they're very interested in the symbolism or maybe they just like the plot. Um, so, or the TV show. And so we can kind of attack it from all sides there. So there's a lot of um, a possibility here for this material. And that's, that's what I really wanted to to bring is just something that we can, you know, have a bunch of different perspectives on. So, yeah. I'm, great. I'm yes. Yeah. yeah. That's the great thing about this series and the show is you could approach it from many different angles and there's so much uh, complexity to characters and events that you can spend hours uh, discussing anything, but it, <clears throat> you know, is, Josh, sorry, Brett, go ahead. Oh, oh no, I was, I was going to say, it was kind of funny because I was just like looking through our drive one night uh see, you know just looking at some of the upcoming scripts and i saw this script in here and i clicked on it and i was like we're doing a cersei episode no one told me <laughs> <laughs> and then so I, so I texted travis i'm like i didn't know we were doing this but i am totally down <laughs> <laughs> just like in a feast for crows she just sort of pops up and she, yeah. she pops up and we are we're taking on a wild ride uh, it's, it's, it's an awesome point of view. So Josh, uh, here at Planet Host podcast, you know, we started, uh, this podcast to, to kind of capture different fans in the community, their stories, uh, their experiences, both with the fandom and the material. So if you don't mind, we're going to ask you a few questions, let you talk about, um, yourself and, and what you you're involved in, in the fandom, what you're expecting in the winds of winter, et cetera. So let's just jump into it. Uh, how'd you get into, uh, a song of ice and fire and game of Thrones, not the fandom, but the material itself. Sure. Um, so what happened, I was trying to think about this cause I had, I've listened to a couple of you guys episodes and I know you guys asked this of your guests. Um, I'm pretty sure because uh, we had Comcast at the time, and every once in a while, Comcast will run a promotion where you get like a, you know, watch this weekend, you can watch HBO. And so we didn't have HBO at the time, but we had it for free that, that weekend or whatever. And I was watching some movie, and they kept teasing it, like, and I mean, just like nuts. They kept teasing this new show that was coming out, and it was, you know, the, the guy from Wire was in it, um, uh, and he was talking about it. And then there's, there's Sean Bean on there. And I was like, oh, well, I know who that is. And they just kept talking about it. And uh, I kind of forgot about it, to be honest with you. And I didn't have HBO anyway, so I wasn't that, you know, that concerned about it. But uh, a little time later, we ended up getting a promotion. Like our contract was up. And they said, hey, you know, we can give you the same price, but we can also add HBO. And we're like, sure, why not? And I, I started seeing another promo for it. And it came up. And I was like, ah. You know, I'm not, I never was huge into Lord of the Rings and I never really did Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but what I did do as a, as a kid was I was really big into um, Super Nintendo <laughs> and I would play games like uh, Final Fantasy, Dragon Warrior and uh, Chrono Trigger, Secret of Mana. I, I love those games and I played them over and over again. And I was like, so this kind of like speaks to me a little bit. And I was like, I wasn't doing anything else. And I was like, oh, this is that show that I heard about. Uh, let me put it on and check it out. And I really didn't know what in the hell to make of it. I mean, the intro was like something out of a horror film. Hmm. And uh, I was like, okay, well, this is kind of cool. And then it was completely different. And, you know, it was this, this pageantry of people coming in Winterfell and they're having a big feast and people are dancing. And I'm like, well, what happened to the to the, you know, the little kid with the blue eyes. What happened to her? <laughs> um, so I, I'm really not sure to, what to make of this show. And then at the end, you know, you have that huge reveal with Jamie and Cersei, and then there's Bran, and then all out of nowhere, you know, Jamie just walks up to him and just, you know, all nonchalant, you know, the things I do for love, and just pushes this kid out the window. <laughs> and I was like, what in the hell? 
did I just watch? <laughs> so I had to I had to watch the next episode, and I you know it you know Tyrion started to become a more prominent character. He gets kidnapped, he gets taken to the Vale. Um, so I thought that was funny, and Peter Dinklage does a great job. And but to be honest with you, I was like, you know, what in the world? How is this? You know, the the beginning is so cinematic and so specific, and none of the rest of the show has anything to do with that. And I was like, I don't know what to do with this. And to be honest, like I remember that, like the instant I was like, I have to find out what these books are and I have to read them. Was episode nine, watching them drag Ned up to the steps of the, mm. and I'm sitting there going, it's almost the end of the episode. What are they gonna do with this? Who is gonna like jump out of the crowd? I mean, it's like, is that Night's nice Watchman guy? Is he gonna do it? But no, he's got Arya. And I'm just sitting there like dumbfounded as the sword comes down and the screen goes black. And I was like, this is not anything I have ever seen in my life. I have to read these books. Hmm. And so that was it. I mean, I was just like, uh, I think, um, I think maybe for Father's Day, I asked my wife to go ahead and, and get me the book for that for that season, just a game of Thrones, just, um, the one book. And she went to the store and she's like, yeah, they had, they apparently have four. And she brought back the four published ones. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, no, but they were huge. I mean, everyone has these <laughs> enormous. Books. I was like, I'm never getting through these, but I did. I, I mean, I just plowed through them. Um, and so, you know, while I'm reading like the third or the fourth book, he drops the fifth one. And I was like, oh, excellent. And, you know, so I, <laughs> I never had to wait for the fifth book. But now, of course, I'm making up for that. Right. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that was pretty much it. I mean, after that, I was just completely hooked. I was just blown away by these books and, the, and uh, just that he was doing things that just, you know, Emmett and Jeff always say, a lot of people in the fandom say the same thing, that he just subverts expectations. And that was that was really what hooked me, is that it was not a typical hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting to me. That was something like, I've never seen this. I want to know more about it. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> I, I like what you said about subverting expectations. But do you also agree that George is – like he loves fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. And he's taking it, and he's making it his own, but he's also using some of those tropes pretty effectively. And I think in the future, we're Brett and I are going to talk about this. But I, I, I like that he subverts them, but I also like he, that he takes the tropes that are traditional in fantasy, and he guns them up to 100, and he makes them some of the best I've ever seen in any sure. fantasy series ever. Yeah, I should, I should say that... Um... I guess when when anyone says that he's subverting expectations, it's it's more, uh, it has more to do with like the typical like Hollywood trope, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. So yeah, and, and he did work in Hollywood for a long time, uh, so that's obviously a reaction to that. But uh, right, yeah, you know, all of us growing up and you know playing video games or watching movies or TV or anything, you know, certain things are going to happen and the good guy is always going to win. And then I'm watching this show, and the good guy didn't win. Right. And that was, I mean, as simple as it was, I was like, that was effective. That I need to know about this. I need to read more. Yeah. Um, and I knew I was going to watch the second season. Whereas before that, I really wasn't sure. I was like, yeah, it's entertaining, but you know, it's not really, it didn't hook me until that moment. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's something that a lot of the fandom um, finds, whether you're reading the book or you're, watching the show we talked about this on earlier episodes josh that there's this escalation of events you know bran being pushed viserys dying Khal drogo dying robert dying ned dying danny birthing i mean it's just this flood of events that you're like what the fuck else is going to happen and each season or each book something different happens and i think that that's you know george is a master not necessarily of a of cliffhangers because i think cliffhangers are cliched but he's a master of hooking you emotionally to these characters and these events that you you have to stay around to see what happens and you're right those while the books are huge 
you you want to fly through them and you want to go back and you want to reread them because it, actually Jeff and I think Jeff and Emmett were talking about this in one of their last episodes and maybe it was Stephen Atwell who was their guest talking about it that you go back and you reread them and you think Rob's still going to win like you think okay things are going to be different now he's going <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> he's going to win but he does you know that he's not and, and yeah. you're just like oh my god but yeah, I, no, that's a good point. Yeah, you you get invested all over again. I, it's not like maybe it's not quite as sharp, you know, when the red wedding happens, but you still you you're still emotionally invested again. Right. So you went through those chapters again, and you you went through their lives, so to speak, with them again, and you're like, oh, oh god, and you're just you're wrecked all over again. <laughs> so, do you have a favorite? Um season of the show episode of the show or favorite book of the series um chapter of the series i mean however whatever you however you feel comfortable answering uh, whatever um, you feel like talking about you know tell us a little bit about that uh my favorite season of the show um is the first hmm. that's the one where after i read those books and i've read them a couple times when you watch that show they I mean, they've got their own stuff, and they, they did some really interesting scenes that they invented for the show um, to kind of expand the world a little bit, you know. Um, maybe some scenes that might have been interesting in the books, but they just couldn't do them because of the limited POVs. Um, and the, one, of the, one of the great scenes that they, they put in there was Cersei and Robert talking about mm. their marriage. And, and the, those two actors did a phenomenal job. Uh, Mark Addy as Robert is fantastic. Yes. Um, but yeah, so, uh, season one was, is always my favorite. I think they just did so well and they were very close to, uh, they, they were very close to the books in their adaptation. They even, you know, lifted lines directly from the books, directly right. from the dialogue. Um, and, and it's not to say that you can't adapt things and change things and edit them as necessary, but I felt that the more that they strayed, like the more, like, maybe the more outrageous they strayed from the plots and the, and the character development of the books. Um, and the, the more it tended to like kind of unravel a bit. Yeah. And so, so like a lot of the later seasons, especially without George's involvement have kind of fallen a little bit flat. That That's probably the most polite way. I, can <laughs> I, I joke around uh, as a lot of people do that, you know, the, the show is, is not very good. And, uh, I think it's just mostly it's just me working out, you know, aggravations. Um, it's it's been tossed around quite a few times, and I do agree with the sentiment that uh, no one no one here would be reading these books uh, for the most part. No one would be involved in these podcasts uh, if it weren't for the show, and this, of course, the great community that goes along with all of that. So you do have to uh, say thank you to the show every now and then. Um, it did bring this. It did bring the story to um, you know millions of people. Right. And, uh, you know, I think this is the, uh, I don't know. I, to me, this is the best community. So it's, yeah. it's very cool. It is very yeah. cool. And I've never been part of any fan, uh, communities before. Um, yeah. but this one is very, very supportive and, you know, very friendly and welcoming. And it's very interesting how you can, I mean, just like you can read these books over and over again and keep finding new things and keep finding, oh, I didn't notice that. I didn't see the way he did that wordplay or I didn't notice that sentence. Um, you can you can find even more perspective just from right. talking to different people that, you know, maybe read it with their own biases or their own perspectives. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, so this is kind of random, but... Um... You know, like the only thing I know Mark Addy from is uh, the, the Full Flint, Monty. The the what? No, Flintstones. <laughs> Flintstones. He was, the, he was in the Full Monty. He was a pretty good character. <laughs> but, okay, <laughs> the only thing I've ever seen him in was the Flintstones and a Night's uh -huh. Tale, and for him to pl be like in like this serious role was just mind blowing to me when yeah, I first saw him. It's funny because yeah, a lot of people don't know him outside of uh, i think he does a lot of like theater work mm -hmm. i could see that yeah maybe that's why he was famous but then he got he got i guess maybe just because of his look you know he's kind of like you know a round guy and you know he's got this big smile and i yeah. guess they thought it'd be funny if he was doing like 
comedic roles and he can do them mm -hmm. i mean I, yeah i, I mean remember, i remember seeing him in a knight's tale and thinking that you know he was pretty funny and then yeah I was like, I remember seeing the preview, I think, for Game of Thrones. I'm like, why do I know this guy? Who is this guy? <laughs> and I yeah. looked him up and I was like, oh, it's that guy from the Flintstones. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, but oh, man, he's excellent. He just does yeah. such a great job. I mean, you almost like Robert just because of how good he is. He yeah. he, ca he captured like the, the, the charismatic uh, uh, attitude. Um, yeah. Of perfect. Robert, yeah, like yeah, it was yeah. it was perfect. Mark like he, Addy is Robert, and uh, Sean Bean is Ned Stark. I mean, yeah. that, I mean, it's definitive. <laughs> yeah, those characters are perfect. Yeah, they did a great job with this. Uh, I mean, they did. A, they've done an amazing job with, in my opinion, all the casting. I think, but oh, especially yeah. those two because they're so important in the first book, and their relationship is so important. Uh -huh. um, and you know you. We're going to talk a little bit about Robert in this episode, obviously, and he does some terrible things. He does, and he does some thing he do, he doesn't do some things that he probably should, which is why he's probably not a great king. But he's just a fun guy to be around in those in those conversations that he and Ned are having. Those, mm -hmm. you know, where he just wants to say, "I just want to give up the crown and I want to go to Essos and I want to put my sword on me and." and ride from town i mean like that's what something i want to see like i want to see robert you know as a <laughs> cell sword uh traveling ss i think that would be great but yeah i'm sorry no 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 you say whatever you want to man yeah no it's just it's funny because now that you're bringing that up um i'm about halfway through fire and blood okay and it it's funny because like that was that would have been what he was better at Yes. I think that's clear to everyone. I mean, that that would have been where he should have been. He he would have done less damage. He would have had a more fulfilling life. Um, but you can see that parallel maybe with like, uh, is it Sarah Targaryen? Oh yep. yeah, that's where you know she she wanted to do all these things and then she got caught and she just kind of like breaks down. And then they send her over to Volantis or, or Lise or something like that. And, you know, and then years later, they're, they're talking about who's going to make a claim for the throne. And she sends her sons and they're like, yeah. well, don't you want to? Because you got the stronger claim. And she's like, no, I'm good. Yeah. She's, <laughs> like, she's like rich owning a bunch of brothels. Right. And, and she did it her like, way. And that was yep. like, you just, you know, described that thing about Robert. And it just struck me as that that sounds very, very similar. Yeah, that's a great point. What are you thinking about Fire and Blood? Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's great. I think it's fantastic. That was the um, – when he announced it and I saw that first excerpt um, from yeah. Jay Harris and Alice saying, the, one of the first things I immediately noticed was just that the the style of the prose was a little bit more like Game of Thrones, a little yeah. bit more like A Song of Ice and Fire. It wasn't – so much like in the world book you had like oh so and so says this but then so and so says this and but no one really believes that so and so says all you know this <laughs> and uh and that kind of the princess and the queen was kind of written exactly the same way and it got very tedious yeah and this this the way he wrote this one was much more streamlined and direct and it was closer to that like third person limited perspective that uh, you know a song of ice and fire is known for and it's it's really a lot of fun and you could tell he had a lot of fun writing it because he got to just do like all sorts of like off the wall shit with <laughs> yeah. characters yeah so you're pretty active on uh twitter um you're at 7.34 and point is spelled out 7.34 on twitter how did you get involved in the fandom online um, and do you have any writings you know are, are you have you written anything on reddit uh, uh anything like that um i'm not on reddit very often i you're a smart um, man <laughs> <laughs> i i mean i'll pop in once in a while yeah usually. yeah uh one of the you know one of the moderators that you know everyone is friends with on twitter you know they might share something post something and say hey check right. this post out on reddit and i'll usually go over and read or you know make a comment or two but for the most part i stay off of reddit sure 
it's not really it's never really been my scene or my speed um but uh i do have i do have one thing that i just wrote recently it's about daenerys and it's funny because i was listening to uh you did an episode with with frank Uh all about daenerys and that was a lot of fun um but you also did an episode with uh i believe her name was beth and that's b word Uh uh-huh yep on twitter oh yep and it's it's very cool because like the the piece of the essay that i wrote uh kind of dovetails and like it's like a perfect companion to that episode that you did with her about riddles and prophecy um because the the whole essay is basically like analyzing like some of the some of the language of prophecy and and especially in her um point of view uh how sometimes it's kind of like confusing or maybe the language is inverted um so i did like a whole like kind of meta analysis of that and it's kind of like maybe 50 percent tinfoil and 50 percent like you know thematic analysis of you know what i think george was doing and maybe some of the symbolism he was using hmm. um but yeah i mean it, it it would go along perfectly with that i mean some of the stuff you were bringing up in in that episode specifically about prophecies and, and so on um i was like oh man this is <laughs> this is my essay right here <laughs> send, send us a link to that yeah, I, no, think you, I think you shared it on Twitter, and I think I, uh, I think I, I, I liked it, and and um, uh, need to check it out again. Um, well, that's great. Uh, you're you're a great um, you're great on Twitter. Um, you actually made some interesting points just in the past uh, few days. So I hope you I hope you write some more and you know, put some more out in the fandom. I think that's important for all of us to like. One, it's it's good, like you said, the fandom. This fandom is so supportive and welcoming that it feels good to share your opinions and your ideas, but also to just have people say, "Hey, this is a great essay," or you know, share it for you or whatever. So I think that's, that's, that's a great thing about this fandom. Other fandoms, Brett and I've talked a little bit about the state of star Wars fandom. It's, it's just not good right now. Um, so do you have a, um, a favorite character or storyline in the books, um, that you're drawn to? Um, I go, uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, obviously a lot of good characters in the books. Uh, I go back and forth on this a lot, but I think, if I had to pick just one, I think I would say Brienne is mm. my favorite, um, and her arc, because it's basically a complete story arc in A Feast for Crows, is just gorgeous. Uh, mm. It's just fantastic, and it's a real shame that we didn't get to see uh, a lot of that on the show. Yeah, I mean, uh, Gwendolyn Christie is obviously awesome. She is fantastic in that role, and I wish they would have given her some of that stuff. Uh, yeah. Some of that story would have been so great. She would have killed it. She would have absolutely nailed it. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the, I mean, there's there's a lot of great stuff, especially in the second, you know, the second half of, of her arc. Um, but the scene that I always come back to is like right after she fights with the, the what is it, the Bloody Mummers in the mm-hmm. Whispers. Yeah. And she's like, she's like standing over this grave and she's right underneath like the weirwood tree and she's like digging this grave and she's like thinking about her master at arms and she's thinking about um dick crab and she's crying and she says you know i you know i didn't trust you and i should should have trusted you but i just can't do that i don't know how um and she you know she's you know thinking about like what it's like to actually kill a person and she wasn't prepared for that and it's just such an incredible scene yeah um, it's definitely one of my favorites that, that is odd uh why they chose to like leave that out you know like i want to know like why I they think, to be honest with you i think she had um time constraints with the force she, awakens and with, yeah oh, that, okay that I, I would say you're right about that the role some. Hmm. yeah yeah that's, it's, it, that's real unfortunate i mean there's so many storylines um, in a feast for crows and a dance with dragons that if they just if they just added <laughs> one or two more seasons, they could have really fleshed out some more. Made it made more. I mean, Dorne is an obvious one. Jamie in the Riverlands um, should have happened sooner. 
mm-hmm. you know, the um the northern campaign of um of the uh, manderleys and stannis and the boltons and all i mean it's just it's just some epic shit that would have been great to see on um mm-hmm. on screen I'm still hoping they reboot it as an anime at some point and just put everything in there once the series is done. It'd be so cool. I I mean, I can't with everything that's being rebooted and redone in Hollywood. I mean, I just this is such a profitable series and <clears throat> with the Winds of Winter coming hopefully in the next year or two, Dream of Spring, more Fire and Blood, Duncan A. I mean, it's prime still for picking this fandom. I think oh, it's yeah. still going to continue to grow and, and be active. Um, so I think you're right. that something like that. And they have I mean, <clears throat> some of the, uh, some of the history and lures that they've done on. Yeah. Yeah. Like those, the those DVDs are... have been pretty phenomenal actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those are pretty cool. And I mean, I like that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Oh, I was going to say, well, and, and I mean, you see like Star Wars had like success with their cartoons. I mean, those, right. Those yep. are huge. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think, I think that the, the, the prequel series or su- successor show as George prefers it to be called is going to be key to seeing if they can see that the fandom sticks with that and, mm-hmm. And uh, they'll probably add. I mean, HBO will probably have two or three Game of Thrones series going at some point in the future. So, Josh, uh, last question, and then we're going to get into our discussion on on Cersei and and gold here. Sure. What are you excited about in the Winds of Winter? Um, I don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good answer. Yeah, that's a good the whole the whole damn thing. Except for people dying, you know. Well, yeah, some people, <laughs> and the way he's teased it out, I, I'm sure some of it's going to be extremely difficult to read. Yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, that's that's kind of one of my my one one of my little theories why he's having just so much difficulty with this book, um, and it's one of many reasons I'm sure that are there. Um, and then there's probably other reasons that we haven't even thought of, but just that it's just so much of a downer that it's just going to be such a dark book and there's yeah. going to be a whole lot of stuff going on like for all of Westeros for the small folk for some of the smaller lords and from all of our favorite main characters um you know people are not going to survive this book you know no. some of our point of views are not going to survive and it's it's not just going to be the ones that were like oh god I'm glad he's gone it's going to be some of like the meteor ones the people that have been rooting for for five books yeah and that's going to be hard you know, that's yeah, going to be a punch. To the yeah, game. I think there's, I, I think there's, anytime you see people talking about <clears throat> what's going to happen in the Winds of Winter and, and how's he going to begin to, you know, draw those characters together, you know, there's the three or four uh, point of views like Victoria and Barristan, Ario, Hota, um, help me out here, Aaron Greyjoy. People are like, oh, yeah, they're, I think everyone could. Uh, concedes that oh they're probably definitely on the chalk block but you're right i think that there's probably three or four more that will be like oh my god and then they might not even be point of view characters they might just be important to the story thus far but he's got to get rid of them in order Mm -hmm. to um to have the winds of winter fit in the winds of winter and have the pieces set for the final book i mean yeah we're, i mean euron's definitely gonna probably kill some uh some people some characters we love i i, I think to set him up as the next big bad uh if, if that's i mean that seems like where it's going and um yeah well and so. we yeah and we haven't even had the white walkers like in the show they haven't even i mean they haven't they have done a lot but they haven't done much to really affect westeros they've really got a get moving um so i think you're yeah i think you're right brad that you're gonna have euron definitely as this big bad but you're probably gonna have another big bad coming south oh yeah yeah definitely all right so um let's get into this cersei discussion uh she's a fascinating character um i definitely have a love-hate relationship with cersei i mean (laughs) her her chapters in a feast for crows are amazing just because they're so insane 
<laughs> and there's like you just said we, we've talked about this on a previous episode josh that we just sat there i think it was our, when we were talking about orane waters that we're like how how can uh how can Pycelle be the the sane one in the room yeah, of this that's group. My favorite part. <laughs> the one that guy that you're just like, God, I hate this guy for like you know three books, and you're like, all right, maybe he's, maybe he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we should be listening to Pycelle. Yeah, <laughs> well, especially when Pycelle's on your side and he's so clearly on your side. <laughs> right, and he's just like, "Don't do this." Like he's Don't. trying. He was right. he, he was trying to screw over anybody that wasn't a Lannister and Tyrion, pretty much. But right. But he's trying well, to help Pys- Cersei. <laughs> Pys- Pycelle is interesting because he's just so clearly like this suck up for Tywin, so that even in his animosity towards Tyrion, it's like just doing whatever Tywin would have done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, instead of like a bracelet on his hand that said, you know, what would Jesus do? It's what we're talking about. <laughs> yes. Because, it's, I mean, it's clear that that's, that's all he cares about. He's just going to try and impress Tywin and he's going to, you know, get the Mad King to open his doors because Tywin's coming. And even though that sounds insane. Yeah. Um, well, and it's kind of funny because um, Kevin, Kevin wasn't at, like, he kind of is like that, but he, but he's not at the same way. Like he, he really steps up after Tywin's gone and uh, kind of puts, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's what Tywin would have done, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, he, I have trouble with, with Kevin. Um, actually, I was listening to an older um, episode of Davos fingers the other day and they were talking about, they were discussing Kevin and they were saying like, yeah, he's, he's not, I know really which episode you're talking about. Guy, but I don't really feel comfortable calling him a good guy. Right. And I mean, it's very clearly in the text what Kevin feels about Tywin and how much he, you know, tried to emulate most of his behavior. And yeah, uh, I think it's, I think it's pretty safe to say that, you know, Kevin uh, was probably like 98, 99% okay with pretty much everything that Tywin did. Right. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or just willing to not, uh or or willing to ignore it which you know mm. just just as bad exactly yeah i mean he's uh, he was either the the younger brother who saw his duty as okay well this is what Tywin wants to do this is what we're going to do or he had the same thought as Tywin. he might not he might not present himself as as ruthless as as a vindictive or sadistic but uh, yeah, either way is is still extremely problematic. But let's let's turn back to Cersei. Let's talk about her childhood here. Now we've we've just gone through this Maggie the Frog prophecy, which again comes out of nowhere. Um, you get inklings of it uh, through the first seven POV chapters in A Feast for Crows, but then we get just this full. Pro- and actually, when I went back and uh, in preparation for the episode to to find the Maggie the Frog prophecy, you know I was in Thursday one and and like on the show where season five opens with Maggie the Frog, <laughs> and I want to I want to talk about that in a little bit because there's a big difference between what the show presents and what mm-hmm. the book presents on that. Um, but I was looking through Thursday one and I was like, okay, must be in Thursday two. I was looking through Thursday, okay, must be in Thursday three, and I just kept going and I was like, where the hell is this prophecy? And it was in Thursday eight. And it's just, oh. I just think it's an interesting structure that it's put so, f- so much farther in her arc in A Feast for Crows. I don't know why that is. I don't know if you all have I, uh, any ideas on why that is. I don't. I didn't, I didn't get to go back through the chapters like I wanted to, but I, did, I, I didn't catch that. I, I would have assumed it, it was earlier, too. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, it might have just been that. George is like, okay, well, here's this new POV. Let's, uh, you know, mm. get Let's into our right. space for a little yeah. bit. I don't really understand her headspace. And, I, you know, then eventually he's going to drop the, you know, that bomb, and I, you kind of start to understand it a little bit more. It mm. it might be because she's so like batshit crazy through all of those chapters, and you're like, why is she acting like this, and why is she so set on it being Tyrion? Uh, that's after, and then the reveal is the the prophecy that she heard when she was a child, and then you're like, oh, now 
you kind of understand her motivations. Whereas before yeah. she's just like, she just seems kind of just hateful without really any cause. And yeah. you, and you kind of see where it stems from. Yeah. I think, um, like her it fear. Kind of, it kind of feels like a lot of the ways that George would structure in his chapters where he puts you like right after something happened. And that's kind of like dealing with that. And then he'll jump back. Yes. And show you everything that happened as you like lead up to it. And I think that's how, that... like how he did Cersei. He's just like, okay, here's Cersei. And this is the inside of her head. You've never seen it before. Um, but now let's step back and maybe try to figure out why Cersei is the way she is. Yes. And, and then I think he, he does do that with the Tower of Joy. That comes like yep. towards the end. So, and that was you know stepping mm -hmm. yeah yeah the same kind of trauma yeah. yeah yeah and even the even the chapters are um structured that way where you're immediately dropped into the action um and then slowly throughout they even go back and reveal well the past few days we've been doing this or mm -hmm. we made the ascent up the giant slants in the veil um and you get the view of the castle and all that from Catelyn's point of view later in the chapter instead of you know a normal author would probably uh, someone would walk up to a castle they tell you the entire history they tell you everything then they move to the next plot point and then they tell you that what's relevant to that George has this skillful way of using the pieces to keep you interested but also to to make a point um, um within the character um so the prophecy has obviously shaped her uh she gets these three important um these three important reveals if you will <clears throat> the fact that you know she's gonna have kids with the king mm -hmm. but they're going to have golden crowns and golden shrouds meaning they're going to die uh there's a valencar which means little brother and Valyrian, obviously. And then there's this younger and more beautiful queen. So it's not just a lot. I think a lot of people focus on the fact that here's her reason for being so paranoid at Tyrion, the Valonqar. But there are two other extremely um, troubling things for Cersei in the fact that she marries the queen. And she she's going to lose her children. And there's going to be someone, you know, from a, point of view of cersei who is very vain a younger more beautiful queen who's going to displace her you know so mm -hmm. that's like a trifecta of of um <laughs> horrific events in cersei's mind that's going to happen to her right oh right. yeah and and just like just like with any other character dealing with prophecy she's probably looking at the wrong person you know i I, I, this want, is just, I this want it. Is just, I know you're gonna say you want it yeah, to be yeah. Tyrion. Just I actually she... want. So I I have this I have this longing for, you know, as Cersei is completely wrong on everything, right, or almost everything. <laughs> and even if she's right, she's there's just this fraction of her being wrong. I actually kind of want Tyrion to be the one to kill her. So like in that final moment, Cersei was right, but no one's left to, <laughs> to, to know that she was right. It's, I mean, that's, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it makes more sense for I don't, Jamie. I, I don't, but yeah, I don't know though. I mean, Tyrion definitely wants to kill her now. And, yeah. and well, if, he doesn't just want to kill her. I mean, he wants to. Oh yeah. Yeah. Her. Uh, hopefully he's moving on. From that. Yeah. Yeah. I, Tyrion. I think he. I think he's gonna move on, but yeah, it would just be weird. It, I mean, it, I mean, it could be all of them killing each other. You know, uh, it, who knows? Because Tywin really screwed up uh, that generation of Lannisters. Because the Lannisters, like even in even in like Fire and Blood, Lannisters aren't that bad. They're not. They're not cruel. They're not. So yeah, I mean. You know, let me interject for a second. Like I said, I'm only about halfway through the book. Um, but I thought it was interesting. Like in the first half, all the way through like Jaehaerys and Alysanne and, and even Viserys' reign, they keep bringing up these Lannisters. Like, oh, so-and-so wants to be Hand, or oh, so-and-so wants to be Master of Coin. And they never really, like, eh, nah, let's get someone else. Like, they never really go for yeah. that. 
it's funny because it's like it, every time it came up, it was always like, ah, no, let's find someone better. There, yeah. there is, I think, one Lannister later that's kind of important, but but other than that, like, there's not really. Yeah, they're yeah, not you're... really prominent in fire. This fire and blood. So yeah, as you as you finish the book, you're gonna you're gonna get a, a a fairly important Lannister, and there there is the fact that one of the Lannisters is it Reyna? Is that that's the is, that's the queen the the queen of the blacks? No, I'm not Rainier. That not. Rainier. Oh no, that's Rainier. Um, okay. Anyways, yes. See, there's yeah, one. I... There's <laughs> one. Maybe it's Jaehaerys's sister, Reyna. Um, the, the Lannisters trying to kind of manipulate. I think, yeah, I think that's. But anyways, right. you're right. And actually, Aziz and Ashea were talking about this on their Fire and Blood reaction a few days ago. That maybe someone asked this question of them, like, "What's up with the Lannisters and Fire and Blood? You know, were the were the Reigns or the you know, or the Tarbex just so much more powerful in the West that they out sh- that, that they outshone the Lannisters at that time, or something? And even Aziz and Ashe, I, I think it was Aziz and Ashe were saying, "Yeah, it's very interesting that they just don't seem to be that important mm-hmm. in the context of these kings." Hopefully, with Fire and Blood too, they'll become more important, and we'll get to yeah. Kind of, oh, um, well, they they, they did uh, they they do help out with one of the. Greyjoy rebellions that oh on. yeah they do yeah that's true mm-hmm. yeah yeah, yeah I mean, I'm, try, I'm trying not to spoil it for you and I almost was like like a, a lot of like I don't because I don't know what halfway mm-hmm. is but uh, I almost was like ah oh, crap we're probably gonna have to cut this part of our discussion and I'm like <laughs> oh wait we have a big warning at the beginning of our yeah. of our podcast we're no, you know it's all good. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, it was a Dagon or something like that. Dagon's Rebellion. Yeah, yeah. All right. I think so, that's her. Yep. So back to Cersei. So not only does she has this have this prophecy, but even before the prophecy, she is envious of her twin brother, Jamie, And she's also envious of the fact that um, he's a man and she's not. And that's a... That is something that she continues to dwell on, you know, into the current story that she sees herself as I think she sees herself as a better man than her brothers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and absolutely. After uh, Jamie loses his hand. What? What is yeah. isn't it Tyrion that says she believes she's Tywin with teats or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. How do you think I, – I mean I think we know based on Tyrion, the fact that, that Tyrion is born, he's deformed, his birth kills his mother. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's said throughout the series from Kevin and from others that Tywin and Joanna were very much in love, mm-hmm. um, that she could kind of – pull him back from the abyss if you will and after his death or after her death excuse me he has no one really to check him and we talked just a little bit earlier brad i think you made the point that tywin and we could talk hours about tywin and how terrible he is (laughs) and the things that he does but one of the primary problems with his children is he is so bent on legacy being important Mm -hmm. the foundation to build that legacy is totally fucked up like he (laughs) fucks them up so bad um that there's there's really no chance for them in a way right yeah i mean and this is that's what's weird about kevin like his kids seem fine like i mean Lan- lancel's an asshole but he's he's a teenager you know uh yeah. but but like yeah like he 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 complete he completely i don't i don't know i don't know what he did i mean he was just like loveless and the thing is though too um it's kind of, well R- robert would be kind of like him in a way where Maybe I, I don't know. Maybe Joanna wasn't all that in love with him, and he's just more. 
infatuated with her and and the memory of her that he's not actually mm. seeing the real her because i mean you get that with robert i mean he, he thinks he's was in love with liana but yeah i mean you could just from what you hear it's like nah he he would have he he might have actually liked her um if they got together but yeah, just but because she liked him. yeah but yeah i don't yeah i don't think she would have liked him yeah no it's he, it's clear that you know she's up i mean almost literally and figuratively on this pedestal yes and maybe uh, i mean maybe tywin did that with joanna and i mean I, and then i guess he probably openly blamed it on Tyrion, and that's where cersei kind of uh gets it when she's younger sure and then and then hearing that prophecy she automatically you know thinks mm -hmm. it's Tyrion. you know i don't know yeah and tywin i don't know i don't know where i'm going well i know where i'm going with it but i'm getting off topic. No, i think that, that but, makes perfect sense honestly uh i mean she saw that from from tywin and there was like twofold things that you know Tyrion came and joanna died yeah so that's one and then number two here's this you know this that you know everyone else that's a lannister has these you know these beautiful this beautiful blonde hair and uh, these striking eyes and they have these great features and they you know they look like they're chiseled out of gold or something like that and then here's Tyrion who doesn't look like that yeah and so it's like not only is his wife gone because of this child but now here's also this very um clear like stain on his you know perfect you know the, this legacy that he was going for this perfect record basically so to speak and so now here's this little stain now on his his image that yeah he want to yeah and and i i don't know if you've seen that fire and blood i i actually i don't even know where it is in that book but like the the child the targaryen with the mismatched eyes and the broken nose there's some more like dra uh, oh. Tyrion being a a targaryen that that just throws more uh fuel on that fire uh, yeah, yeah that's um was that a Alyssa? yeah i think it's Alyssa. yeah i think yeah. you're right yeah so another um another place for where tywin especially screws up his children uh, in this case cersei is rhaegar and the mm -hmm. fact that she is so infatuated with Rhaegar, even to this day, I mean, she's comparing Lorraine Waters at first <laughs> uh, to him. But Tywin, what, was telling her, you're going to marry this prince? This is this is what you're going to do? This is right. your, your husband? You're going to be queen through this guy? Um, and again, it's just this buildup that Tywin can't reach and it obviously comes crashing down and and it uh completely screws up uh, his daughter because of it right yeah and i mean it's uh to me it sounds a whole lot like that line that jamie has where he's you know talking about ned stark and he says you know by what right does the the wolf judge the lion and it's just that that's all just tywin Mm -hmm. building up their sigil and the fact that their lions to be you know better than everyone else but it's like you, this dragon is on this level right <laughs> way above even lions guy i mean you yeah. are, you're way out of your league still yeah <laughs> um, so that was that was what he wanted for his daughter not even for her but for him to say that my daughter is not married to the king and we're we're the same right. we're just yeah. as good yep yep so um, she obviously is extremely envious of Jamie, but she's also completely and totally infatuated with him. Now we can we can talk about whether she is later on in life or whether it's just something that she thinks she has and can control uh, the entirety of her life. But she even goes to the extreme at as a young girl to kill Malara, who. Uh, mm -hmm. shows interest in Jamie and I think that happens in the in the Maggie the Frog um yep. scene isn't she ask will I marry Jamie mm -hmm. so is she the girl that she pushes down the well is that right I, yeah I think it's it's isn't it yeah. yeah it's I th I don't think it's like specifically 
Uh, right. That, well, the girl like dies by falling in a well or something. Yeah. Like, come to find out, or you think it, that Cersei did it. I can't remember exactly, but uh, the scene, uh, the way it, it reads, is something like she asks about Jamie, and Cersei just like remembers thinking like, "Oh, you just you're an idiot. You know, Jamie's never going to go for you. Yeah, you're not um, good enough." <laughs> yeah, and then and then she, Maggie, you know, when it's her turn to speak, she says something like, "Can you smell death?" Her, you know, her her breath. Can her breath is death? yes, and, like death is very close, to, or she is very close to you, or something like that. Yeah. The way it's worded, it's like it's it's specific. Oh, that okay. Is a female, um, so it's it's definitely implied that she's talking about Cersei as the one that is going to kill you. Okay, yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. I mean, that just makes sense too. I mean, Cer- Cersei's so she's so selfish that she would mm-hmm. do something like that, right? Um, as a child, and just be like, ah, you know. <laughs> yeah, and even if it's not love then or now or any at any time it's just that it's like this is mine yeah you can't have it and you know i don't don't think cersei loves anybody but herself i mean truly i mean she sees jamie as the second half to her and that's the only reason she cares anything about jamie but it 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 all is centered around her and then same thing with her children i mean i I, yeah like like show cersei is a, a lot better of a person uh and more competent and actually you know makes logical uh choices in the later seasons even though that they, sh- they seem like they're trying to write her as someone that's crazy but sh- it's just not coming across that way <laughs> in the show yeah i mean i mean she i mean like in the show i mean she basically she basically, you know, out, you know, outsmarted everybody, and right. and then, you know, I, you know, I, well, I guess the one thing she, well, even even her not, uh, even her betraying uh, Danny at the end or whatever of that last season. I mean, smart move. I mean, if she wants to keep power, that's she's just gonna have to roll the dice. I mean, yeah, it it, it seems more like that's. Um that would have been like a little finger move or something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. So yeah. It's different for her character in the show. She definitely seems like she's got a, and she's cruel. Yeah. She's definitely she, cruel, but she's got like a grasp of what's going on and she knows how to play. Yeah. Whereas in the book, it's more like everyone is just getting the better of her. Yeah. 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 Like she's totally getting manipulated by the Tyrells. There, there's no way she's not mm-hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> I mean, just the part, I mean, it's just clear, it's just clear when, when she says something like, she says that thing like, oh, Tywin would have been proud of me (laughs) or something. It's like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So last point about Cersei and her um, childhood is this, Josh, as you, you stated in the script, this inverted Oedipus complex. So why don't you take that and explain a little bit what you mean by that? Yeah, so I mean, it's not like a you know literal one to one thing, but it is kind of like so. Oedipus obviously is this person that was trying to avoid um, a prophecy, and you know went out of his way, and you know his parents did this thing and sent him off to live somewhere else. He didn't know his true parents, and then it's kind of like telling you that no matter what you do, if you're fated to do something, it's going to happen. And so it's just like a gender role reversal, basically. That uh, instead of Oedipus the king, you have kind of had like almost Oedipus the queen, in a way. And you know, mm. she, so she got this prophecy. She was told these things, and you know, um, there's obviously other steps involved and other reasons. But now she's like, okay, we got to get rid of Tyrion. And the reason being is that she really, really believes at this point that Tyrion is coming to kill her. Yeah, and so he wants to be one step ahead of him and get get him out of the picture. That's gone. I don't have to worry about that part of the prophecy anymore. And it's the same with Marjorie. It's like, oh well, here's the, here's the beautiful queen. Let's mm-hmm. get her. You know, let's get the faith to arrest her because obviously she's been doing some you know immoral things. And uh, you know, so it's it's this like this charge, like head on into a wall, basically to try and avoid this prophecy and that's you know it's all obviously coming crashing down upon her because she's 
uh, well, she's paranoid and she's making these mistakes, but it, it just, it feels very strongly like a parallel to that story, to that myth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I think we, do, I, I can't remember, but I think we talked about that in episode two. We did that in the, yeah, we did that in the episode with Beth. We talked about Oedipus mm. f- from a standpoint of the riddle that's, um, um, that he overcomes in order to take control of Thebes. But I like what you said uh, about prophecy, the fact that fate, if you're destined for a fate, you know, no matter which path you take, you're going to, um, you're going to have that fate visited upon you. Mm-hmm. But also I think with Circe's, and I think George is doing this in a lot of way with prophecy in the books is if you acknowledge prophecy and you constantly think about it and it becomes part of, well, I'm going to try and change that. Then you give that prophecy power. Mm-hmm. It, it becomes true because you make it true because it's mm-hmm. so important to you that and, – and in the case of Cersei, because she is not that well adapted at, at ruling and making good choices, that she falls right into – it's plots, it's schemes because of it. I just like that 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 fate's always going to get you, or acknowledging it, you're going to make it true. <laughs> she, oh god, <laughs> she, she, and she. I mean, man, like she, she takes things way too personally too. While oh. she's in court, like ev- everyone's out to get her in her mind, and she's literally not befriending anyone trying to actively fuck over all these other people in court like yeah they're out to get you because you're because you're you're yeah. actively trying yeah. to <laughs> yeah like, right like you're actively poking them you know <laughs> right yeah. so yeah, let's that's, that's in, sorry josh yeah no that um <laughs> sorry let me just get this in real quick that's interesting the way you said that um because i think it's absolutely the case of you know, is it is it a question of that, you know, we're fated and we can't avoid it no matter what we do? Or is it a question that it becomes more self-fulfilling because yep. we've made these steps towards or away from it and it's actually towards it? Yeah. Um, and it's like both of those at the same time. And it's like, well, you know, it, and that's why Marwan has his famous line about prophecy. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Pretty much you can't do anything about it. I mean, one way or the other, you're going to get screwed. Yeah. Um, and I think that's interesting because, of course, George loves his like dualities, like just to play with, you know, expectation right. and everything, and irony. So let's let's turn to a character that <clears throat> we come to find out, and like we said earlier in the episode, George, in his masterful way, makes us feel sympathy for Cersei, makes us mm-hmm. um, empathize with her, even. Even when we don't want to, we <laughs> come to find out that she suffered emotional, physical, and sexual um, abuse by Robert. Right. Um, and it's really devastating, um, as we talked earlier about Robert, that, you know, not, and I don't want to dwell too much on Robert, but you at once feel sorry for the guy because he didn't want i think at his core he never wanted anything to go like this i mean he even says to ned on the on his deathbed that you know it, it's probably better off that he is that he does die that that he's you know mm-hmm. look at the fuck up he's done look at this children all this stuff he he has that recognition but he was so absent that he allowed these rats to infest the court he didn't do anything about it right and um he is so absent as a father and a husband that he completely turned his family against him um and his vices his promiscuity his alcoholism um his um you know unhealthy appetite all of that both sexually and um nutritionally um (laughs) led him down this terrible road um but when he when you find out that 
Cersei saw this man, this, and again, she's vain, but she's seeing this attractive warrior, this guy who looks like a king. And then that night, he draws on her, or he crawls on her drunk, rapes her, and whispers Lyanna's name into her ear. That's it. She's done. Like, she's absolutely she is done with him and it doesn't happen just once happens pretty much throughout their entire um marriage and you know they've been married for what 13 14 years at this point um so it's 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 a long time to deal with such abuse yes uh, it's 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 incredibly heartbreaking yeah uh but yeah i it, it, it does. It, I mean, even even just knowing that she was gonna give it, a, like she was up for it at the you know at the beginning, and then right. I mean, you can you can argue, okay, why was she up for it? Well, was well, she up for it because he was so attractive, or she was gonna be queen? But regardless but, of but, that, I mean, those are minor compared to yeah. I mean, the fact that. I mean, I'm not. I'm not going to excuse the murder she did as a child, but, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I, she does have a thought where she thinks she could fix Rhaegar. You know, him being sad all the time or something, something like oh, that. Yeah. And yeah, good... you, you could tell. Like, I don't know. Like, you, you could tell that there was something there. I mean, she, she was definitely more human before. Now, I mean, now she's just. Uh, and another another thing too is her walk of atonement that she has to go through where she like kind of breaks down in the middle of it and like keeps falling and like she's crying i mean that i mean see like even in uh season five when that when that happened and then her, like throughout season six when she was going like actively going after the sparrows i mean i was rooting for her mm-hmm. uh, which was which was weird because like I, I liked her a lot more during that season when yes there was like <laughs> like what happened to you is that, I mean that's just messed up you know mm-hmm. like she deserves punishment but they you know not like that that's just messed up like that's yeah. just one of I think that's one of George's masterful scenes because it's like you are reading you know Feast for Curves and you're just like oh my god. Yeah, yeah. It's just like every chapter, you're like, "What in the hell is she doing?" And then you get to this thing, and you're like thinking, "Okay, this is gonna be a spectacle." And you're not really sure what to expect. And you're going through it, and you kind of, you know, you know, she's very proud, and she's like, "I'm not gonna let them bother me. I'm not gonna let them bother me." And you're like really invested in this, and then she starts to break down, and slowly and gradually, like she cuts her feet, and she starts. She's like, "I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna let them see me cry." And then she starts crying. And then she's weeping and then she's running. And by the end of that, you're just like, holy shit. You're like, what? Why in the hell would anyone force anyone to do this? Right. And then it, you absolutely are on her side, even if it's for that brief window. And it, I just, I love it when George does that because he's just, yeah. yep, guess and, what? And like the, the ending to that is so sad. Like, I, like, like she gets there, who who throw someone throws a cloak around her. It's either Kyburn or Kevin. I think it's Kevin though. I want to say, or maybe Kyburn does it. I want to yeah, say it was I, Kevin. I don't think it's Kevin. I think he's or is he not there? He, isn't he absent he in the there. books? Yeah, he wasn't there. Oh, I thought he came back because she was imprisoned. Because Pycelle, I think, sent a letter calling him back, explaining he, the situation. He's in the show. But he and Pycelle are just standing there staring um, when she enters the Red Keep. Oh, it's uh, Kyburn that throws the okay, and then and then like, yeah, and then Robert Strong scoops her. I out. think I think in the books she's she's seeing all these men. You know, she I think she's seeing Joffrey, she's seeing Tywin, she's seeing all these people that she's almost hoping that they're there to save her, but they're just they're basically ghosts or. Um, hmm um spirits or, or you know imaginations um um right. you know th- th- it's not really there I-, I think that's how it is in the in the books okay uh, but he is in the show but he's just standing there staring basically like uh you know okay this is over and i'm in control and okay let's move on or whatever yeah. um but so let's talk let's talk a little bit about 
um, the fact that she has Robert murdered. And to your all's point, it, 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 Josh, it's, it, I, I've said this to Brett before. If I open the Winds of Winter and I see Ramsey as a chapter, time, I'm done. Like, <laughs> I do not want to feel sympathy for that motherfucker. Uh, but you're right. You're right. Oh, I, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, or it's probably not possible. But still, if anybody can do it, George can build in oh, sure. the, the empathy uh, and the and the sympathy that that you know you might find out more about him. And I don't want to know any more about him. Like I just I, want him dead or whatever is going to happen to him. Let's move if, on. Yeah, if, I mean, if he if he does sympathy for Ramsey, he's going to have to do sympathy for the mountain. You know. Yeah, uh, or Robert, yeah. or whatever, or or sympathy for uh, Tywin. Yeah, <laughs> or, yeah, let's not go there, George. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. So she's she has Robert murdered, um, <laughs> and um, I mean it's it's a masterful stroke by her that she's going to get him so drunk that he falls off and gets gored by a boar. Mm-hmm. Um, how long do you think? she had this plan and, and do you think there was any nefarious intent behind the scenes by Tywin? I mean, was there's no, I don't, I don't think that, but do you think there's any conspiracy between Tywin and Cersei leading up to I, this? Uh, I, I think it's an interesting thought, but probably not. Yeah. Just I think because I, I don't think he puts a whole lot of stock in anything that she uh, plans. I kind of agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that meant because because yeah I was totally up in the air I'm like he maybe but but now that you said that yeah, yeah I, I think I think it's in the the show right where he like is talking to her one time and I think uh, Charles dances like uh, you oh, know man. you're not you're not half as clever as you think you are or something. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, or something like you know you're not it, it's you're not in charge because. It's not because you're a woman. It's because you're not as clever as you think you are. Right. Something right. like that. Yes, yes. yes. Now, and, and, as much as I dislike Tywin, those scenes with him in the show are some of the best. Like, one of my favorite scenes is when Cersei is just sitting there gloating because she knows that Tyrion is going to have to marry Sansa. Yeah. And she's just giving him such shit. And then Tywin... Not even missing a beat, says Tyrion will do his duty, and so will you. It just turns to her. And she's like, What do you mean? And he's like, You will marry Sir Loras. And she's like, I will not. And he was like, Of course, he <laughs> says something terrible to her. Basically, it's, you know, <laughs> you're gonna have sex with him and breed because you're a woman. I mean, it's absolutely terrible. Yeah, but it, oh my god, like, and again, there, I'm feeling sympathy for Tyrion in that moment, and I like Tyrion, but I'm like kind of rooting like yeah tywin tell them tell them <laughs> what they're gonna do. but it, it's funny too because he i, I mean th- those two are just like the disappointing children in his eyes and then he thinks even though jamie's the one that's the only one who disappointed him or has yeah. reason to disappoint right. him and jamie doesn't give a shit like yeah the other two at least give a shit i mean you can say what you want to about Tyrion and and cersei but they actually care about their father's approval and they want like they both want him but jamie could uh, do no wrong in his right, eyes yeah, yeah. Ramey, jamie could do no wrong but jamie doesn't give a shit like he's like i don't give a shit about any of this basically <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh I yeah i mean even, uh, i think he was excited about you know being knighted and becoming a king's guard because you know his his hero was Arthur Dane or whatever. Right. But even that, it was like, uh, yeah, okay, well, I'll be a you know I'll be a king's guard because you know Tywin's the hand and Cersei's at the capital, so that means I'll go to the capital too, so we can be together. I mean, that was like his his primary motivation. Like, right. You know, it's like he's just like, well, I'll go to the castle and we can be together. Uh, so I mean, clearly from you know whatever you know, fantasies he had, like Bran had his, you know, fantasies about joining the King's Guard. Um, Jamie is was more like, Yeah, this is cool. We can do this. I mean, yeah. this works good anyway, because I want to bang my sister. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, All right, let's, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go oh ahead. no, I was I was gonna say it, it's just weird, like we, like J- Jamie is an interesting character. I mean, it's just weird because you find out like he's only ever slept with Cersei and he's been like faithful to her. Yeah. 
But but you're like, ah, that's still your sister, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a strange character. All, all three of them are just very odd. So let's talk about um, not only her inability to rule, which I think is is a personal thing to Cersei. It's it, it's it's something she just can't do. Mm-hmm. But she's also weighed down by the fact that this is an extremely, extremely misogynistic society mm-hmm. that's just completely unacceptable, uh, unaccepting of female power. So, Josh, why don't you expand a little bit uh, about that here? Because I, I think you want to give a shout out to a couple people in the fandom who have some really good essays on this topic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I couldn't possibly do this justice um but i think they are fantastic uh points that have been raised by uh, a couple people and uh two in particular that i'll give a shout out to would be um uh, melanie lot seven and baal the bard who have uh they've both done some some cool video uh, and essay work kind of discussing that type of archetype of uh you know a usurped or silenced woman um, and how often you see it throughout the series, because I, it's one of those things that is, is so very obviously present when you know where to look for it, but right. you might not grab it right away. Like on the first read through, you might just be like, oh, okay, well it's you know medieval and that's just how they were. Um, but there's just, there's so many stories about it and so many characters where you see it and, you know, these councils where they had, you know, crisis of uh, succession or whatever and they said well we have this you know this daughter and they're like and eh, no, 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 let's not do that um it's just so so important to the story that george is telling and and the two of them uh definitely i'm sure there's thousands of others that have, have written great stuff too but they have done a fantastic jobs of, of pointing out that perspective and I, I definitely will get some links over to you guys and hopefully we can get the other people to check out that work too because what's really interesting about it is that even in the um even in the like the mythos of the of the long night and everything you have this this idea of here's the here's the hero of the story he's got a flaming sword but in order to like turn on the magic so to speak he's got to kill his wife Hmm. you know so there's you know the man is important the woman is not um, and then you, in the world of Ice and Fire, we saw it too with like, which seems like a parallel of that story is the Bloodstone Emperor. Yeah. Here's, here's this Empress who was in charge and her brother came along and said, nope, I'm in charge now. Um, and you see it with Euron and you see, I mean, you just, when you know where to look for it, it's just striking um, that these, these women have been silenced. These women have been usurped. Uh, they've been cast aside uh, for, you know, male power and dominance yeah i i mean I, and you know that's got some real world uh parallels too i'm sure oh sure definitely do you think just to talk about this topic for a moment <clears throat> and i think some people are turned off by the series because of um the misogyny even though george is you know using it from through a historical prism right it's hard for us in a 21st century to kind of look at that i mean even though there are still absolutely significant problems in our own society but it's i don't want to say it's not as bad as it was it's still very bad but just definitely not it's a different level of bad it's not to this degree it's not like this you do you, you have a problem with it, Josh, or do you look at it through George is just using the historical um, facts? Uh, you know, the, the world building he, he created was to use this archetype. Um, you know, I, I have to admit that some of the, the more striking things, maybe, uh, especially on the first read through, didn't. Uh, maybe i didn't notice them quite as much as i mm-hmm. probably should have um and then when you read them again and you kind of like you kind of see what's going on and you talk to other people like especially in the fandom that have different perspectives and they kind of like wake you up 
and you're like, oh, this is actually uh, maybe a lot more serious than I, you know. Mm. It's um, it's like when we were talking to Frank uh, Travis um, when he pointed out like how like Stannis has like a lot of uh, sexist comments and stuff that he says, and I I don't remember any of yeah. them. You know, yeah. and then until I, well, until I went back through him and I'm like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, he, he really was making a lot of, uh, terrible comments. So right. now there's two that I can, I can talk of, um, that I didn't, maybe I didn't notice right away, but the more I've like kind of lived with these stories and reread them and, and listened to people talk about on podcasts, um, one is Stannis and one is, uh, Kevin Lannister. Since we brought him up earlier, I'll bring him back up again. Okay. Um, but there, in the prologue of Clash of Kings, there's this scene where you know they're having a feast, and Patchface is dancing around, and uh, he crashes into Ma uh, Maester Crescent, knocks his his hat off. Um, everyone's laughing, and then they say something about like you know Maester Crescent has some warning or something for everyone, and uh, everyone's calling him a fool, and they're saying, "Well, why don't you put on Patchface's hat?" You know, you put on the hat because you're you're intent on being a fool, so you you put on his hat. And uh, you know, even Stannis says, you know, hey, you heard them put on his hat, but, you know, but, which is so weird. Uh, it just but then, but then uh, Solis says something. She makes like a further comment, and he's like, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. he like shuts her down, and it's like basically like, well, you know, mm -hmm. don't uh, don't embarrass him or humiliate him. You know, he's he served me well. And it's like it's okay right. if he makes it <laughs> right, but it's not okay if Salise does. Yeah, right? and that's definitely something that's jumped out at me. And then the other one, like I said, for Kevin Lannister that uh, jumped out at me recently is uh, he's like kind of feeling bad. It's the it's the last it's the epilogue for Dance of Dragons, and he's talking about how he feels bad, you know, looking at Cersei, and he can't really he doesn't really want to look at her. Yeah, she, she's so broken. Yeah, you know, and he's like he feels kind of bad about the the walk of atonement, and uh, but then he's like, but she's you know she's she's learned her place, and she, yeah. she's more than now. Yeah, so you know it's probably better for her that she learned her place that way, and it's just sort of like this one eighty, like all of a sudden you're like, whoa, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That that is like it's like it's almost kind of like uh, I don't know, like. It's just weird because it, it it comes across like he he cares, but it's a really messed up. It's view. a messed up way. Yeah, right. It's like oh well, think, yeah, like I don't know. But, oh, keep, go ahead, Travis. <laughs> well, and I think what you just said about Kevin is very interesting because <clears throat> um, the fact that he looks at Cersei and he feels sorry for her, but he doesn't act on it. He doesn't do anything to try and help her. And I think as a reader, like you said, the first time through, you know, you're just enjoying the story. You're you're drawn to the certain characters. I mean, I gotta admit, like when Celise comes onto the page, I'm like, oh my god, you know, get her out of here or whatever. <laughs> but that's that's opened my eyes. And actually, Frank made a point on the last episode, on the episode that he was on, and we're having him on for a um, a Stannis episode in the future that he's kind of opened my eyes to you know some of the things that i should be looking at especially with that character who's one of, one of my favorites but there are some really really problematic things that he says and others say and yes i think it's a product of the world but it's almost like george amps it up to 11 if you take the spinal tap um <laughs> reference and it's just it's just it's harsh like you're right josh reading it it's, it's hard to read this i mean that's the case in point when you know jane pool is raped and mistreated and abused at right. winterfell like you feel terrible I, I mean i gotta be honest but you're like it's jane pool then when the show throws sots at you're like oh my god i can't believe they're putting her into this situation like it's just i, I mean it's bad anyway but like in that point, that's where I was like, I can't believe that they're going to put Sansa through this. When I should probably think how terrible it was for Jane Poole to be put 
through this to begin with. But I didn't. Yeah. I, I mean, I do. I do feel. I, I'm not saying I never did. I, I might have to edit some of this, but it it, it was from we a different perspective. Do that. That we don't do it, that on this. We don't. Cast. Yeah, we don't. We don't. We don't edit. Things up. No, but, but you know, when it became was, Sansa, it was just so. It was so terrible. I was like, this is just. You know, I, I just. I, I could feel my skin crawl. It, yeah, no, I, one thing I remember that uh, definitely uh, on the show, it's it's been difficult because those scenes, like you know, they're supposed to be more shocking or they're supposed to be more of a spectacle, and um, I, I think they have not been handled very well, um, either by the writers, the directors, or both. Um, one I remember that kind of like made me feel kind of ill was the scene that happens between uh, Jamie and Cersei and a lot yes. of, you know a lot of people did not like that. Oh, you talk uh, about in the in the uh, over what is it over sept. Yeah, okay. Joff- Joffrey's body. Because yeah. I mean that that scene is very different in the books. Oh, it, yeah. It seems very much more like Cersei is trying to dominate him and trying to get something from him that she wants. And not that, you know, gender roles reverse makes it any better, but it seems much more like they were both in that moment and that's what they needed or wanted. Um, whereas in the show, it was very clearly a rape scene. Yes. Um, and there's really no other way to look at that. So that was not a comfortable scene to watch. Yeah. And yeah. I think whatever George is doing with the violence um, in his books, there is a point to it, whether that comes across as debatable um, and it should be debated. Um, but he's giving you more information and context about that. And he's, he's trying to give you some sort of indication as to why he's showing you that picture. Whereas in the show, it's like you're not in anyone's head and there's all this other information it's... that they're just, you know, cutting right out. And uh, so th- a lot of those sequences are coming off just – there's no, there's no other way to look at it other than just to take it at face value, and face value just seems very wrong in some of those situations. Yeah. Yes, it, it's it's the same way um, with the racism that is in the books. Um, I was on Twitter and I saw someone asking Gray Area, um, the, I f- I forget, but basically someone you know was hurt. I mean. Because, I mean, they describe one of the, like, he described, like, one of the characters describes one of the Summer Islanders, or, or one of the, I, it's either one of the Summer Islanders, or, a, or, I, I, or they might be half Dornish, half Summer Islander, I can't remember, but anyways, like, there's like a whole, like a horrible description of them, and, uh, you know, this, you know, uh, I think, I think the, one of the users was black and she was like that that you know really hurt my feelings like reading that but she i don't i don't know i mean she i mean she knows you know she re, she's a fan of the books but it's like yeah we read it and we're like yeah wow that's messed up but you know it may, it doesn't affect everyone the same way and that's a good point that it should be debated it's not like he just put it in there to put it in there there's a point behind it but you know i could see why some people can't take this kind of book or or have a problem with it so you know yeah i don't think there's i don't think anyone disagrees that george isn't you know yeah not progressive and you know um not supportive of yeah yeah it, a, a, a progressive agenda but it is it is hard again it's hard to look through it from a a 21st century prism one of the yeah. ways that i think and josh I, we'd like to get your perspective on this is um and this is going to you may and I, i'm not going to spoil anything for you for fire and blood but there's going to be a, a section toward the end or a comment made toward the end about women hmm. and the fact that women kind of bring the realm back together Mm -hmm. and i think george you know he has a he does have a lot of female point of view characters and i think we'd all agree they're going to be extremely important to the end game um 
of A Song of Ice and Fire, and they're also likely to be part of the reshaping, rebuilding, reforming Westeros. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that excuses some of the problematic areas, nor does it um, overshadow the historical parallels that George is using. But I think toward the end, women... I don't think I don't think there's going to be this great democracy <laughs> and everyone's free and you know everyone has a living wage and all this stuff. Women are going to be very vital to the end game. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I, and, I their, think... and their experiences are going to shape how Westeros, if there is a Westeros, a, how a Westeros goes on. Right. Um, I think you've got some very strong uh, female characters, especially. Um... Sansa Stark sort of springs to mind like instantly because it seems like a very strong possibility that you know that's where she's going uh end game that she's going to be one of the last people left um that maybe is you know it, it seems it seems like a very strong possibility that John will come back and then maybe be like a last hero type you know go out into the land of winter and you know do whatever he does and it seems a very strong possibility that Daenerys will also uh, die in the last battle. Um, so you need that. You need someone that is learning the game uh, of Thrones and learning how to do it well and do it better than what they're doing currently in the story. Um, you need someone that has under, you know, has seen all the manipulations and how all that works, and then maybe is learning lessons from her mother like uh, or you know good queen alice saying that you know her goal is to make people love her um it seems like a very strong possibility that she is going to be the queen at the end um and so if she has other supporting characters like if brienne if she survives or asha um that are these strong like willful women that you know have it in them to be leaders and rule um that she could draw from their strength maybe um, yeah. And I, I don't know. I don't know what the fate is of these characters, but it's, it seems like if you look at it from that perspective of all these women that have been cast aside um, throughout the series and throughout the lore and histories and all that, um, it seems like in order to write that and to you know fix the balance, um, the imbalance in the world, that, that putting a, a woman back on top would would make the most sense thematically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What. Well, it's it's kind of interesting if it, if it does kind of work that way in the end. It's kind of funny because you have you have um, the uh, why am I blanking on this now? Uh, the uh, the empire the Targaryens fled from uh, Valeria. 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 Wow! Wow! I, I can't <laughs> believe I just that left my mind for a second. But anyways, you have Valeria where. They seem kind of like they had equality among men and women from from kind of how the Targaryens were. It may have not been exactly the case, but um, but it seems that way. But they were still awful because they had slavery, and then then they migrate to Westeros, where slavery is illegal, but the sexism is rampant, and you know women basically don't have rights. And what you know, maybe at the end of the series, it kind of course corrects everything to where women have more rights. I mean, obviously, they're still gonna, you know, still have like a you know a sexist society, but but uh, you know, eh, you know, it's a little better, you know, at the end. Yeah, that's one thing. Um, fu I, I fusion of cultures or something, you know. Yeah, I think it's uh, Baal the Bard on Twitter. I think she brought that up. I don't remember if it was in her essay or not. But she had a really cool thread about how she's looked at the stories that we've gotten in the world of Ice and Fire for everything in Essos and like really like Far East Essos. And aside from like a handful of things, it seems like the norm is more like equality or women rulers. Whereas the more the further you go west and then towards, you know, Westeros and the Seven Kingdoms, it's all male dominated power. Yeah. So, like in the world of Ice and Fire, there's like the the cities in the Bone Mountains, and there's all these oh. warrior women. Oh. Um, you know, have like the you know the empresses in like Yt, I think. Yeah. Uh, 
and they kind of like you know whoever whatever color is in charge it, it doesn't matter uh so much if you're male or female um and i think is it i can't remember exactly i'm not that familiar with that but is is there like um is there custom now that they have like one like yt husband and then one langish husband or something like that i don't know I, I can't recall, but I think like the I think maybe females are actually in charge down there mm -hmm. now. Um, I know there's a city on the other side of the Bone Mountains where, like, all the men are eunuchs except for like a select few, <laughs> and uh, the women, the and Danny runs into some of them when she's in the uh, the market. Oh yeah. Is that, uh, is that the Joe Goes Nye or something like the, that? Yeah, yeah, yes. they have the nip, the the pierced nipples or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and it's like they have leaders yeah. that are women or they have leaders that are men and they have different roles. And they it's, it's, it's kind of funny because uh, Radio Westeros has their, uh, their, they have an episode about, I guess, I guess most of the information's from uh, World of Ice and Fire where they yeah. talk about the travels and they cover them. And I think they say something about, Yoke Boy says something about, yeah, technically so, somewhere on the long, along the lines of, you know, the, it's basically all incestuous if you only have, I think it's like one in a hundred men are <laughs> um, not castrated or something. Wow. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. And then the women the women roll and it's on the uh, other side of the bone mountains, which is like one of the farthest, um, Eastern, uh, known civilizations that exist. Yeah. So yeah, that definitely makes yeah, it's just interesting. Cause I mean, George is clearly putting it in there. You don't notice, notice it right away, but, uh, she brought up some very interesting points when she did. And it was, it was cool to hear that perspective because it really made it seem like, a lot of the misogynistic uh, parts of society in the story are coming from either maybe the Valyrians in some way, or but definitely like the Andal culture. Yeah, and uh, you know they're kind of reinforcing that with the chivalry and the you know there are seven gods and you know this is the way everything needs to be because women do this, right? And men do this. I I wonder if that was on purpose, and I wonder if. He's got the Dothraki out there for a reason because they're pretty far east, but there's a lot of like empty um, cities that they've destroyed, that they've overtaken, and they're just kind of running all over the place out there, um, stealing, uh, you know, stuff to put in, uh, what is it, the uh... Vase Dothrak? Vase Dothrak, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So. So back to Cersei, one of the ways... We got way that, off topic. We got way off topic. That's fine. That's fine. That's what we do. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, not ways, really. Is, but yeah. One of the ways that she tries to overcome the misogyny, in, you know, in a way, and it's a, a historical parallel um, to other women, especially, you know, an Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, is that you... You rule through proxy. You rule as a regent through proxy of your children. Yeah. And Cersei, and you know, this is an interesting dynamic that Cersei, especially in the books, we don't really get a sense that she loves her children. I think she loves them. I think it's more of a selfish type of love. Um, or in the show, she seems, I think, to really love them. Um, but she uses them obviously as her proxy to power. Again, she's a woman. She has to, that's the way she is able to exert authority. Right. Um, but, uh, again, that's a, that's a historical parallel. There are numerous women in, in history that that's how they ruled, especially in medieval Europe. Um, but Sansa, Sansa, um, she obviously, you know, you've got the the combination of Sansa and Marjorie as these young, future beautiful queens. Cersei obviously fixates, especially on Marjorie. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's talk a little bit about Sansa here, as that beautiful queen ar archetype. You know, Josh, you you made a note that she's got these parallels to Snow White um, and other fairy tales, and I think that that's especially putting her and Cersei next to each other, really the right. image now of Snow White and 
um, the evil queen in that fairy tale come to mind. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. And you also wanted to give a shout out here as well uh, about this. Yeah. And it, it's one of those things that I think that is kind of apparent. I think this was kind of apparent for me, even on the first read through is how uh, George is kind of taking all those, those children fairy tales um, and kind of turning them upside down. And, uh, you know, so she does feel like, you know, the princess trapped in the tower, like, you know, you see in, in Rumpel, uh, Rumpelstiltskin, the, yeah. this, like Miller's daughter is trapped in this tower. Um, mm. And that, that is a trope that you see a lot. I mean, it's kind of everywhere. Um, and then the Snow White parallels, because you have this wicked queen and, you know, there's this, you know, sort of not really a, like a daughter in, or a daughter-in-law, but uh, basically just about close enough. Um, and she she feels like, oh, this is the beautiful queen that's going to take everything I hold dear, you know, and it's like you're you're just waiting for Cersei to show up and like, you know, talk into like the magic mirror or something like that and say, you know, who's the most beautiful. And th this is definitely a shout out to Girls Gone Canon because they've made uh, very clear distinctions about this, not only with Sansa, but um, some kind of interesting parallels with maybe Sandor and the, the Huntsman too, and just how striking mm, yes. it seems that George is really like taking this and saying, you know, here's what maybe, you know, maybe m more of a hardcore version or maybe a more realistic version of what that fairy tale would look like. And I think it's just very interesting that he's doing that, that he's kind of like, again, subverting like the tropes a little bit. I, and, I uh, I wonder if he thought about that when um, Cersei was uh, burning the uh, Tower of the Hand. Um, I mean, I know it was for Tyrion, but maybe he was thinking, oh, like, you know, I don't know. Like, just burning a tower that seemed like it had been, you know, like, you know, because Ty Tywin stayed in there and was controlling her, you know, controlling her mm -hmm. Tower of the Hand. Mm -hmm. um, and then she burned that down, you know as a symbol of her power and overcoming it. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'm reaching with that. I don't know. Well, I think that's a fair point with Tywin there, Ned there. Yeah. Like yeah, just, just, all, just people, just people who got in her way. Yeah. And all men as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's strong. I, I think you could see that uh, definitely if you wanted to, um, you could look at that as like maybe her way of saying, you know, I'm in charge. I'm the regent now and I don't need a hand you know, all these people that were hands and yeah. were terrible and now they're dead and I'm not. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, he may have not been thinking about it, but it definitely kind of works in that, uh, that theme though. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> okay. Let's talk about some more paranoia, more poor decisions that are going to, um, that are already currently affecting Cersei in a feast for crows and a dance with dragons, but are, um, going to become more prominent and and um, some new ones as well in the Winds of Winter. So I want to I want to run through some of these. Let's just discuss these in general, and and we'll then move on to some of our gold symbolism. Talk about that a little bit. So first of all, High Garden, the Tyrells, Marjorie, Elena, uh, Mace, um, all of the Tyrells that uh, <laughs> that have really pissed her off uh, from day one. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the coin in the black cells uh, right. that was planted there. We think by Varys, right? Mm -hmm. um, to you know, kind of say that they're the ones that loosed uh, Tyrion. You obviously have Tyrion uh, out and about in the world. Right. Um, he's eventually coming back to Westeros. We know. Uh, Orain Waters has absconded with <laughs> with her <laughs> fleet. Well, no, it's his fleet. Let's. Let's be clear here. Uh, <laughs> he killed it. Um, he manned it up. I just want to know where he's going. Yeah, I, just... I love it. I love him. Absolutely love him. Um, Tana Merriweather, she is clearly an informant for someone, and she uh, has fled the moment Cersei was arrested. You got the High Sparrow and the Faith Militant. Uh, we obviously see how, see how that works out in the show and how that ends in the show. Kevin, right. Kevin's murder, which is going to be a huge shock to the entire city when the fallout from that comes. Mm -hmm. 
You've got uh, Fagon. I, I don't, Josh. I don't know if you believe that he's fake, um, but I think most yeah, people. Yeah, uh, so you've got Fagon Targaryen um, landing in the Stormlands. Um, you've got the Dornish getting ready to join her or join uh, him, uh, especially in the form of Arianne Martell. And then finally, depending on, and we'll talk about this a little later about where we think Cersei's end game lies in the book and the show. But you've eventually got Daenerys Targaryen coming back, and you also have Jon Snow, which let's not forget that Cersei <laughs> wanted him murdered uh, mm. as well at one point. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. I forgot she, about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have all of these people that Cersei – and you know, I don't think the show is necessarily off in the fact that – Cersei's going to be have some pivotal arc to come. I mean, we don't think I don't think any of us think, you know, she's gonna lose the trial or the trial by combat or whatever and be executed. I mean, she's gonna play some role, whether she's in King's Landing or she flees to Casterly Rock or whatever. Yeah, I um, think she's are, gonna I think she's gonna flee to Casterly Rock. Flee. I think Aegon's um, definitely gonna sit the Iron Throne for a bit. Yeah. But so I know I know We've got this a little later <clears throat> um, in our script, but let's just go ahead and talk about that now. Like, w based on the, you know, let's talk about these further paranoias, but let's also talk about what happens to Cersei in the book and, and in the show, and and whether the show has maybe necessarily muddied our view of what's going to happen to Cersei in the end. Yeah, it could yeah, it could potentially have. Right. So you you just said, Brett, you think she's going to somehow flee <sighs> King's Landing for Casterly Rock? Yeah, but but I see I see what like what what you just said. Uh, the show may have muddied our our uh, our view of what what's going to happen because yeah. you know it could be the only reason Cersei is still around in the final season of Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm is well well obviously we know is because you know lena lena headley is you know one of the best act actor actresses on the show um right but she may not necessarily make it to a dream of spring her downfall might be at the end i, I think she's gonna make it through most of the book um of of, of t wow but um I imagine Aegon's probably gonna uh, take the throne. I don't know. I just don't see how, like, if that if that prophecy comes true, I'm not. Sh I don't know. I don't know. She might make it to the last book. I, it's just it's hard to say. It just it, it depends on how how quickly the next book moves. I guess. Yeah, and let's let's be clear. The <clears throat> the young, more beautiful queen. That's the one who casts her down now. Whether that's in the context of, um, you know, she's already d displayed. It's kind of like the the Danny prophecies, you, you know, where the she could have already been betrayed for gold, mm. or it might come later on. But the young queen casting her down could have already happened, or it could come. So potentially with Fagon, it could be Ariane Martell. Mm. Her death comes at the hands of the Valon card. Yeah. So, and you know, Jamie to me, Jamie's arc in the Winds of Winter that that's the one that I just I don't know how that's going to work out. I don't know how that's going to end with Lady Stoneheart and Brienne and all that. I mean, I think I have a general idea how it begins with the Brotherhood without banners, and so, I just don't know where that's going to go. So somehow, I think obviously Jamie and Cersei have to hook back up. Yeah, um, for the Valencar to happen, or for them to have some sort of resolution as brother and sister, but mm. I, I just I, I'm like you. I d I don't think she dies in King's Landing, but I I I I think she goes to Castle Rock in, in uh, some regard. Josh, what do you? But, I mean, sorry. Uh, if if she does make it to see the the if she does make it back to Castle Rock, um. I just I don't know how that'd go. I feel like I feel like the Tyrion using the sewers to his advantage um 
somehow, like fishing her out of Castro like Rock, would be probably along the lines of what happens. Um, I mean, because he's mentioned it, and why would you mention like? It's just like one of those weird details. It's like, oh yeah, I know. I even built a secret tunnel, I mean, there, and there are people that believe that when Danny invades, she'll invade from the um, west, from the east and oh. the west. Um, I've seen some people talk about that Tyrion will siege Casterly Rock and come from the west with some of her forces. I don't know, huh. Josh. What What do you think about Cersei and her end game and? Uh, maybe how the show might have muddied that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't. I think it seems pretty clear that George wanted the end game for uh, her and Jamie mm-hmm. to kind of. I mean, she even says it. I think. I think there's a quote from Cersei where it says, or maybe it's Jamie. I don't remember which one it is, but uh, one of them says, "You know, we were born together." We entered the world together, and we're going to leave the world together. Yeah, um, that seems like more than just, uh, especially when you combine it with the Valonqar uh, prophecy. It seems like more than just like you know a, a nice turn of phrase. It seems like it's kind of important. Um, and uh, I'm not sure where that happens. Yeah, uh, I don't have a really strong feeling one way or the other where that happens, but it seems like that's kind of where the two of them are just gonna like they're their stories are basically just going to end that there there's probably not going to be unfortunately there's probably not going to be a a grand resolution for jamie and and the sins he's committed um and i don't think i I don't think cersei's even capable of atoning for any of hers i i think you're right which is sad because i'm actually i'd be more okay with Tyrion dying and jamie living (laughs) than than uh than jamie and cersei dying together because it's just it's just what she would want like she's so selfish she would just like if i'm dying jamie's gotta die and it's just it would just i don't know (laughs) yeah it's just like i don't want her to have things she wants (laughs) (laughs) like Tyrion's just like Tyrion's selfish and you know he he's got more of an it seems like he has more of like a malicious evil side to him than jamie does jamie is just he was just kind of arrogant and like only thought about himself but he wasn't malicious i guess i mean he was a little bit but i don't know Cersei and Tyrion are more like tywin i think yes Um, yeah especially you know when they really get dark i mean Cersei's kind of dark the whole time but when Tyrion really gets dark uh that that's another good line, though, from A Feast for Crows, I believe. And it's from uh, Gemma. Yeah. Is it Gemma yeah, Frey? Yeah. Lannister, whatever she goes by. Um, I... Where she says that, uh, you know, you're not you're not Tywin's son. And that's Tyrion. Yeah. I mean, you even um, get Tyrion, like, I think he smacks Penny. I'm not, does he smack Shay at one point? Like, I mean, Jamie don't do that crap. Like, so... Right. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, he bangs Tyrion, his sister, but but he doesn't. <laughs> he's yeah. Mono- he's monogamous, monogamous when it comes to that. So, right. um, so yeah. What about the the show ending for Cersei? Um, what? I think it was interesting. It really stood out to me because I don't. I know you probably want to talk about this a little bit later. I think you hinted at it anyway. They don't, I don't think they did the Volant car in the show. Right. Um, but what they did do that really jumped out, you know, off the screen for me was they have this scene with um, Arya where she's in the Riverlands. She's finally come back and she's with all these Lannister soldiers and they're singing the Hands of Gold song. Uh, so they, they made a very clear connection between Arya and this song, uh, and it struck me as uh, like an interesting possibility that you know Arya has someone's face and goes and kills Cersei, like she thinks, you know, she dresses up like Tyrion or she dresses up like Jaime even, yeah, and fools Cersei into thinking it's someone else and lets her guard down for a second, and I, that's how it goes. 
I, I have faith in the books more than the show of making that more believable. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I'd agree. Because I just, I just like, I like Maisie Williams. I like Arya, but like that whole fight scene between her and Brienne, where like Brienne's like dedicated her whole life to fighting, and then this girl that's like 90 pounds <laughs> who has only had like the like the two lessons from from uh <laughs> Sirio Pharrell somehow knows how to sword fight now uh even though she, you know I don't know I just I thought that was just not a good scene <laughs> a lot of people love I mean it was a good scene I guess it was a great scene but but there was it nothing yeah it didn't make any sense and that like that yeah that threw me off well that's yeah. it that... go ahead go ahead that's an interesting point about the hands of gold thing um yeah. but yeah yeah i didn't catch that yeah. yeah i'm not i'm not crazy about that but it seemed like for some reason they really wanted to connect yeah them. it's <clears throat> it's it seems like they might go that way um because because they're definitely i think after season five i think they're definitely playing off like the fan service stuff for better or for worse maybe a little more now because they want to you know they want views and they want a strong ending and if you know you know i'm not gonna like harp on it but you know they might uh like season five compared to season six i mean season six was a lot more fan servicey and then even season seven too so right so Let's move on to some of the gold symbolism that um, is associated with Cersei and also um, with characters and houses in the show and the books. <clears throat> so, and even in our own real world, you know, gold is associated with highly ambitious people, often those vying for power and or the crown itself. It can be a symbol of greed, of grandeur, abundance, wealth. Gold in mythology and religion can be a symbol of courage and virtue. Um, In Christianity, you have the modern interpretations of the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, which obviously tend to be good. Um, You have the bad, evil um, symbolism of gold in Christianity through the golden calf. That's the um the deity that the israelites are worshiping while moses uh is atop mount sinai um speaking to god and then in ancient greece you have the golden fleece uh which is something that jason and the argonauts are pursuing gold can also be a metaphor for old age and wisdom and knowledge you know if if you're talking about your uh your parents or your grandparents it's usually referred to as they're in their golden years um, or if you think of, uh, let's stick with the the um, uh, kings and queens. If you think about the reign of Elizabeth I of England, it was the golden age um, for that um, uh, for that country. Um, but specifically in A Song of Ice and Fire, there is a ton of symbolism of gold, uh, whether it's heraldry. Uh, or uh, those vying for power. So uh, first off, uh, Josh, you've got – we've got the Golden Company. We've got House Toyn here. Mm-hmm. The fact – and they've got a lot, a lot of gold symbolism. Now, yeah. first of all, they're called the Golden Company. <laughs> uh, yeah, hard to miss. Hard to miss. Hard, hard to miss that, but you know, their, their motto is our word is, is good as gold. And obviously, beneath the gold, the bitter steel, that's bitter steel skull, which is um, the most uh, metal thing ever. The most, the <laughs> most metal thing ever. I mean, they, they have a fucking ring of pikes with golden skulls on it of all their previous captains. Right. Um, they wear golden arm rings on them, and their captain general um, uh, is in a cloth of gold tint uh in their camp right uh specifically with the lannisters you all of them are which i think is interesting with the golden crown you know not only 
uh, are they wearing a gold crown but they're crowned in this golden blonde hair mm-hmm. um and tywin's been the hand of the king f- numerous times Tyrion um has been a hand of the king and Jamie has the golden hand right so they're kind of all golden hands they're all ah! golden hands yeah. yes yes <laughs> i love it they are all golden hands in a way yeah. that's that's great i like that I always miss crap like this. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> this, this stuff goes way over my head until someone points yeah. it out to me. No, I love this stuff, and there's yeah. definitely a whole section of the fandom <laughs> that just looks at the wordplay and looks at the symbolism, and they catch all sorts of crap that goes over my head too. <laughs> but I love just like sitting there and like absorbing this stuff. Yeah, because like I said, some of these symbols and some of these metaphors and wordplays that he pulls, as soon as you know where to look for them. You read the book again, and you're like, there's hundreds of them. You're like, how yeah. the hell did he hide all these, and I never saw it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, the Baratheons have a lot of gold symbolism around there. Not only is their banner uh, a black stag on, uh, I think it's on yellow, but it's definitely a gold color. Robert's king, um, Stannis, obviously, with that vision of, you know, a a burning crown that consumes him Renly, i'm not so sure about um you all may have some more examples of of where gold enters his uh, i mean he's obviously very allied with the tyrells which are golden roses doesn't have the um, golden antlers oh does he wear the golden antlers okay yeah it does. okay uh one thing that i th- kind of think is the way that donald noy describes him as copper copper really isn't you know gold but it's in that context it's kind of it's it's kind of like gold that it's shiny but it you know mm-hmm. it, it's it's pretty to look at but there's really not much worth to it that's just something that kind of jumped out to me what Again, about what about like the crown stag like referring like kind of like a stag but it's got the crown which would be the gold where it's yeah. kind of like a Lannister yeah. disguised as a Baratheon, pretty much. Yeah, and in the show they change Possibly. his sigil. They uh, in the show they change his sigil to a golden stag on green, which I think is uh, you know kind of a Tyrell parallel. Oh yeah, yeah, the green. Yeah, the green definitely. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, he's covered in green. I mean, the first time you meet him. Yeah. Yeah. Think, uh, what at the Castle Derry or whatever. Yes. Yeah, that's he's where he's got, he's got I, the yeah. golden helm, but the rest of his armor's all green. Green. I right. think his eyes were green too, for that part. And then they were. Yeah, George, <laughs> George made that mistake. Yes, you're right. Uh, yeah, that uh, you know, or I'm, Sansa saw it as green. I think is the way George described it. Well, well, he said he made a mistake, but then he course corrected it or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or maybe I don't know. I'm just that's what I heard. Not not fact, or it could be fact. It's not fact checked, like I said <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, yeah, yeah, you don't have to worry about that on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that I did not know that you were a part of it until you said your Twitter username earlier. I looked you up and I was like, "Oh, I, you're you were a part of that that uh, that whole Twitter conversation <laughs> uh, that we had the other day." And I'm like, "Oh, I've been following you for quite a while now." Um, <laughs> But uh, the, um, I, I am mad that uh, Rinley was not – well, no, I, I wasn't mad at the time, but I'm disappointed that Rinley wasn't uh, in that scene with um, like Joffrey and, oh, and yeah. the, the whole little dispute oh, right. right after Where Arya. La- Where he laughs at Joffrey. Yeah. 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 yeah Which is great. a very sexist comment too. <laughs> yes. But yeah. – all right, so continuing on, we've got the Greyjoys, a golden kraken um, on black. Aegon the second, gold dragon on black. And then I think his dragon itself, Sunfire, it was a golden dragon, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's where he took his sigil. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it took his sigil, yeah. And it, it's funny because, um, you know, Robert Baratheon is known as the Usurper King, and he's got that gold sigil. And Aegon the second was also called the Usurper. 
Ah, huh. yes, so yes. It's, it's it's this like vying for power, this like power, like I'm going to get this, like, this ambition. And that's why you kind of see it with Stannis and Renly as well. I mean, Stannis has a claim to the throne and he is uh, oh. the legitimate heir, but Renly is also like, oh, I'm going to be king now. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, so that gold is like there. It's, it's present yeah. a lot of the time when people are looking for that power. Yeah, yeah. and if, if you stick with that, I mean, yeah, uh, uh, Fagon, same thing. Yep. yep, and the Golden sure. Company with him with the Golden Company. Yep, absolutely for sure. So, um, House Darklin, you want to talk a little bit about that, Josh? Yeah. So, um, the Defiance of Duskendale, uh, I believe, was it started over uh, the taxes. They didn't want to pay taxes to the crown anymore, and I believe their sigil even. Um, has like golden coins on it or something like that. I, I can't mm. recall that one exactly. Um, and then they were they were related somehow to uh, House uh, Hollard, which is yes. Dantes's house. And then his sigil is the three golden crowns. So uh, there's this this theme of gold there when um, you know people are like saying you know uh, well you you might be the king but I I don't want you know maybe my claim is better or or maybe i don't have to listen to you because you know you're mad or whatever is um, is little fingers uh mockingbird silver or gold i think it's silver oh uh, yeah 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 no i tried to look for specific colors to match with with it, him but i don't it is silver gold. it's yeah it's silver because when i think that i think that speaks to his character though because i don't think he wants the iron throne like he says in the show i think he wants to be like the hand of the king that everyone trusts where he can just manipulate things mm -hmm. maybe not the hand of the king but you know he he wants to be the behind the guy the scenes kind of guy profiting off of everything yeah um or that's what it seems like he he doesn't have like he's hasn't set a motivation and it's hard to read him and what he might just like chaos i don't know but but he yeah. is he does he definitely is, like <laughs> he is definitely like uh catlin uh does like pick off that like you know he's got silver in his hair um uh, I, I think there's a few other instances like instances where she mentions uh silver with him or silver but he he was master of coin which definitely is yeah. symbolized you know everyone thinks of a gold coin so right. he's got some symbolism there he's good at right. multiplying golden dragons yes he is yes yeah, he likes to rub them together to create a third one right um some further uh gold symbolism <clears throat> daemon targaryen um wow he likes to rub golden dragons together to create a third one he create you know he's basically responsible for the war of five kings and all these kings uh popping ah, up there you could go. be something <laughs> i don't know maybe yeah no. sure so uh daemon targaryen um you know initiated the gold cloaks um what they wore as commander of the city watch uh just a few more here house merryweather um they are symbolized by a golden horn spilling out bounty surrounded by a gold border house slint obviously uh, another close uh, connection to the gold cloaks, uh, and they're man, they're God, their sigil, a bloodied golden spear on black, bordered by gold and black checks. God damn, <laughs> I fucking hate Janice Slint. Uh, yep, shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then House Stokeworth. Oh, poor little House Stokeworth. Uh, <laughs> oh God, I feel so. I feel bad white, for them. A white lamb holding a golden chalice on green. Right, it's just that that little bit of gold, like yeah, just a little little bit of gold. That. That's like that's like a white lamb holding a golden chalice. Like, please take this from me, because I mean, you've got Cersei and Bronn, <laughs> like oh, Bronn, yeah, and you know Bronn's taking that. He's 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 totally. He's already killed. Like yeah. he's already pushed someone down a flight of stairs well, or something. Well, and then you got Cersei. Like, didn't she uh, throw some one of them down in the black cells? Um, or she is gave Felice. Felice, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she gave him. Yeah. <laughs> Let's. Oh God. <laughs> 
Um, and then finally, um, and I'm sure we've missed some, but this is oh this yeah, is there's a lot tons. Of but D Dario Naharis, he's got the gold mustache, he's got the yellow clothing, head to toe. His weapons are gold. Um, uh, it's just he's such an interesting character. But where's he from? Uh, Tyrosh. Tyrosh, like. I'm not sure, like, Danny is so obsessed with him. I'm not sure all the blue and the gold, and like, that'd just be a lot for me to deal with if I saw someone <laughs> dressed like that and looking like that. I mean, yeah. I know this is a different culture, but... Yeah, yeah, that's just George. He's just having fun with this. Yeah. You know, I, I really wish they would have been like, okay, let's just let's just do all the descriptions in these books, and, like, let's just roll with it. Like, because... I mean, I don't know. I just it would have been funny to see, uh, like you know, his his whole beard and his, because that doesn't it, isn't his beard like in like five or seven different points or something, and it's gold yeah. and, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's like tied by little gold little gold bands or something. It's tied. yeah, and I think he doesn't he he dies it a few different times, right? Or I know he does it once. Uh, yeah, so when he. Uh, I think he, when he first shows up, he's got blue hair and a uh, blue mustache or something. And then every his beard is gold, I think. Oh, okay. His, his clothing is all yellow and gold. So, like, you know, everything's blue <laughs> and gold and yellow. And he looks like a big canary or something. <laughs> um, but then when she moves to the pyramid in Marine, um, like, the pyramid is all purple. So then he changes everything to purple. Oh, so he's 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 a, he's yeah. a he's a fashion guy. Yeah, yeah he's, he's kind of which, an interesting character. Which even even the Dothraki, they have the bells in their hair and stuff. Like none yeah. of that was put. Uh, the, the 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 Dothraki are are a lot more interesting in the book. Like just some of the stuff they do and and are wearing um, is is really cool. I'm. Uh, I mean, I guess that's probably tedious in the. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, some of that would be tedious in the in the show. It'd be hard to hard to deal with those minute details. Yes, yeah. So, Josh, what's this um, Unchained ASOIF? Um, you want to yeah, give a shout out here? Yeah, that's all of them. And another one that I'll, I'll shout out to because it has to do with. Um, he wrote a, a, an essay about playing the clever and basically like you know, looking at that as kind of an archetype. And it, it, it sort of correlates to this gold symbolism thing where it's like um, characters that might be playing similar roles, doing similar actions and having the same themes as the land, the clever story uh, throughout Song of Ice and Fire. And he compares them to, uh, to Tyrion and Tywin and, um, couple other people that pop up and and he shows why like you know their actions are this or their story is this and uh you know um some of the language that george uses when you're looking at these like archetypes and these symbols you'll notice that some of the language is always the same and that's how you can kind of be certain that that's what he's going for um but it's just a really it's a really cool essay that correlates with this this gold symbolism and uh, so anyone that's kind of playing that land the clever archetype you could probably fill in here and get the same kind of idea and be like oh he's yeah. trying to like you know come into power or he's trying to like you know screw someone out of something it's um, it's kind of like the uh the ticks that frank pointed out um every yes. time like a certain yeah. like s certain characters have certain ticks and right. yeah and then it always means whatever the whatever that tick is like I've only so since then I've only paid attention to you know when someone's basically lying like mostly dunk like yeah he he does he does do like he he always worries about his ears turning red or him moving his feet or something but <laughs> um I've never I haven't applied that to just other random things someone's doing um They'll do it sometimes with like a glitter in the eye or a glimmer or some sort of. Thing. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, Littlefinger always has mm -hmm. something. Uh, like 
he uh, i think he has something like that right like some like a mischievous or i i think it, it comes up a lot with a bunch of different characters but i think yeah you're right. i think there is like a little little finger scene with that yeah oh no i'm thinking i yeah yeah I, well i'm thinking of the the little mischievous uh gleam in the eye i'm thinking of the guy what's his name john the fiddler uh from uh the third duncan egg no, novella okay oh uh, yeah 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 <clears throat> yeah you see it come up like when someone's like either like withholding information or maybe has like another angle that they're not you know being clear about like something mischievous is going on yeah yeah and it could be like you know it could be innocent or it could be much more like <laughs> you know complex uh it really depends on the context but the, you'll see it frequently that there's something like sparkling in the eye or something like that it's kind of like yeah. george we, indicating we, that there might be something else there we need to look into um the tattered prince and see what what the hell yeah. he's up to yeah um yeah he probably has some tick or something yeah um maybe yeah. let's talk a little bit about gold as a shroud i mean you know specifically in the context of cersei's prophecy that refers to joffrey marcella and tommen but josh talk a little bit about some of the other ideas you have on gold as a shroud here yeah so it's kind of like um i guess it's a parallel symbolism of gold that uh you can see um, that he uses like sometimes concurrently or maybe just uses in a different way. Um, so there's a quote here I, I'll read um, from Tyrion 1, A Dance of, with Dragons. And it's it's him talking to Illyrio. And Illyrio says, in Volantis they use a coin with a crown on one face and a death's head on the other. Yet it is the same coin. Ah. To clean her is to kill her. So they're they're speaking about Marcella and the you know the plot that you know what they were thinking of to do with her and uh, but you you see like it's kind of like George saying that you know this ambition this this going right. towards the gold uh, so to speak is kind of foolish and it's going to end up like killing you and that that is like a perfect parallel to the to the golden shroud prophecy from Maggie. Um, and what you'll see it, um, it's, it pops up a little bit. So like there's down in Dorne, there's House Manwoody um, of King's Grave. And literally the sigil is a skull with a crown on it. Hmm. So, I mean, it's like the exact same thing as this Balantine coin, but it's just, and, you know, just this random sigil that he's hidden in there. And, and, they're, and they're in a city, a castle called King's Grave. Right, exactly. It's awesome. <laughs> um, I mean, you can, it's like right on the nose. I mean, you couldn't right. get it any more clearer than that. It's, uh, you know, if you're looking for gold, it's going to kill you. Then you've got, um, you've got Viserys, who literally dies uh, by having a golden crown poured over him, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you've got Dantos here, shot by a crossbow through gold crown. Mm-hmm. Um, Fagon, you know, he's driving right toward the crown and the um, um, the throne. Talk about Robert. Okay. You know, um, you've got this great quote here, and and again, as soon as he's crowned, it's almost like he dies. I mean, fifteen mm-hmm. years ago, from the beginning of the story, he starts to die, right? Yeah, and so the reason I brought this up is it kind of like it's just another parallel, but it's more like an in-world, in the real world parallel because it's uh, it's this archetype that you see if you look at like um, all these you know ancient mythologies, you know like Gaelic uh, or Celtic lore. Um, you see like this idea of of the Wicker King motif or the horned uh, the horned king and uh have you so, have you been listening to lml <laughs> i do i, 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 I do too <laughs> and, uh, well it's cool because it's like you see it with um there's the 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 oak king and the holly king so the holly king is the winter side and the oak king is the summer side oh. and when you look at robert it's very clear that robert is this like you know 
uh, you know, he wants to party all the time. He wants to he wants to sleep with all these women. He's you know spreading his seed all over the the kingdom. He's having all these bastards. Um, so that's like the fertile side. That's like the oak side. And then um, when the holly side takes over, that's when it's like you know he's starting to get fat. He's starting to get slow. Um, he literally dies in the first book. Um, on a, you know, like on a big wild hunt, you know, he's trying to reclaim his glory and then, he, you know, he's killed and that's when the winter side comes over, takes over. And then, I mean, you can literally see that starting to occur. It's starting to get colder in the stories. That's like the main theme of the story is it's no longer summer. Now it's, it's winter. And there's actually, um, not even just the Oak King and the Holly King, like there's another specific legend, um, that, uh, I think it's I think it's Celtic mythology, and and I'm probably I'm probably wrong in that, and I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but there's a a queen like an ice queen, um, and her name is Kylock, I think. Hmm. So she's the one in charge of sowing. And then when you get back to spring, which they call Beltane there was a a similar inverted queen named Bridget. So she was like the spring or summer queen. Hmm. Um, So it's, I mean, you can see this pattern, it's everywhere. Um, So the the quote that I have here, I think is pretty interesting. And it's one of those ones that popped out to me much later. You blew my mind with um, just now with Bridget uh, being another word for summer. The name Bridget. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's where that came from. It. I, mean, I think I, so. I, I, had to not, have. <laughs> I couldn't speak that intelligently on it, but I think that is <laughs> that is basically where that name comes from. Um, but anyway, there's this quote from uh, Edward Seven in A Game of Thrones, where Robert's kind of lamenting that he's not in his glory years anymore, and uh, he says, "I swear to you, I was never so alive when I was winning this throne." or so dead as now that I've won it. Mm. So, I mean, it's like, even in just one single little sentence, he's got that whole Wicker King mythology laid out. Mm. He's got this golden shroud thing laid out. He's this, he's done it in one sentence. I mean, the, right. it's just incredible that um, he's put that whole thing right there for you. He's showing you that, you know, going after this crown is going to kill you. Yeah, I love that. I love that quote. I think it's it's... Uh, it's extremely sad um, when you think about it in the context of Robert's life, but also mm-hmm. it's so important <clears throat> with the, not just ambition, you know, I don't think ambition is necessarily a bad thing to some extent, but the fact that the focus is on that throne and that crown mm-hmm. where the focus should be on these other issues, these white walkers, et cetera. Um, and the people who aren't looking toward that are probably the ones who are going to fail. Now, there's probably going to be a lot of people who change course in the story and say, I, oh, well, they're okay. going to have to. I mean, well, they're going to have to. Eventually. Right. <laughs> but the people who are solely focused on king's landing and that throne and that crown and taking power um are going to fail miserably oh yeah and and again it kind of goes back to that prophecy discussion that we had earlier that you know it's like you said josh it's it's almost self-fulfilling that it'll get you well the ambition will as well that yeah okay you want this well this is what's going to happen to you it's going to destroy you mm-hmm. i mean and you can look at um the king midas myth yes yes i mean he he basically says oh you know i just want gold i want all the gold i can get so you know let me touch anything and turn it to gold and they're like okay and he gets that power and then he realizes he can't eat food and then he wants his daughter to come and console him because he's like made a mistake and then he loses his daughter too right. so i mean it's it's it, george george is making it very clear here that looking right. for that throne is not what is an indication of, of anyone's you know happy ending or success in this story 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's really sad too, because if you think about, um, if, if Ned would have known about the white walkers, like if, if somehow he didn't cut the dude's head off, the dude was able to explain his situation and, um, relayed it to Robert, Robert might've, uh, found a new cause you know yeah 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 <laughs> like and, and it would have been a completely different i mean yeah i mean yeah he still did a lot of terrible <laughs> things but maybe he could have i mean if theon can have a redemption arc you know robert could have had one yeah yeah wow <laughs> well that's a lot of great um symbolism for gold in the series um let's let's turn back to cersei and let's begin our um final part of our discussion here <clears throat> and i want to jump around here a little bit i want to move back to the fact that um again a gold symbolism taiwan taiwan is you know the epitome of of gold to an extent uh in the series both in his look i mean mm. not that Lannisters have gold flecked eyes, isn't it? it said that the color of their eyes is flecked with gold. Even it sounds familiar, and I I want to say yes, but yeah, I think they have green eyes flecked with gold. Um, Tywin and Jamie and Cersei. Um, Twitter says yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, Cersei truly believes that she's Tywin reborn. Um, and she completely fails to understand that that she's not, and that inherently weakens her family's regime, um, especially following uh, Tywin's death. You know, I don't think Cersei is. I don't think we think Cersei is inherently stupid. I think that she just makes really stupid choices. Um, I think it's more life. that she just thinks everyone else is dumber than she is. Yes, yes. <laughs> like you said, like that quote that that. Tywin says to her in the show that you know it's not because you're a woman it's just because you you're not as clever as you think you are mm -hmm. um <laughs> and when you're not that when you're not as smart as you think you are and you're trying to in, uh imitate the person in Tywin that has kept your enemies in check you know you you become in a very vulnerable position and Cersei has the added problem where she just can't see that like she just She's got these blinders on. Um, so, you know, show, show Cersei seems um, more dark and cruel um, and sort of a black and white villain in the context. Um, Wait, you think show, show Cersei is more like that? I think in the context when you put her to like to John and danny and the rest i i don't know well okay yeah more black and white well i don't know she yeah i guess now she just seems more i don't know i i they, I, I would have to ar argue a little bit with you on that one because she well, i think part of it is actually like it it's just made out to be she actually loves her children and she's at, on on the show where in the book she never has that i i would say like she's just completely selfish and just not in tune to anything and and in and in the show you can kind of see her uh she kind of draws a line and uh, like i mean she didn't like she could have killed Tyrion, but didn't and you could see like emotion on her face um uh, i don't know it's weird because well i think that i i and I, I i think i agree with you but i think part of it is the fact that i mean she's in, a villain on that show but she yeah she's a villain on the show but we i, I think she's a villain i hate to say it like that I don't think she's a villain in the books. I think she's made to be more villainous. Um, but like we said earlier, we begin to understand more about her past trauma yeah. and the reason she is. And I think that that, 
we don't know that about show, show Cersei. I mean, she might say a few things like the scene where she talks about Rob or she talks with Robert in the beginning that they were just so terrible to each other. Yeah. But that almost put them on the same level that you were mean to me and I was mean to you. It, Not you raped me, you came to my bed drunk and it, crawled and on it, top of me. It could be it could be the fact that you're not in her head too. Um, yeah, I, I don't think Dan and Dave went for this, uh, but <clears throat> it could be the fact that she's like Sansa to where she's able to, um, cause you see, I mean, you kind of see in her head in the books, but, and, and, and same thing with Sansa. A lot of people don't like Sansa and think she's, you know, stupid or whatever, but you're looking inside her head, but the way the characters around her are reacting they're like, oh, okay, you know, like, you are dumb, you know, like, yeah, and she's not, you know, she, you know, you, she, she just has low self esteem because she's trapped, and maybe the same thing with Cersei on the show where she's able to fake those emotions to mm. get people to around her to sympathize. I don't know if that's the case, but th there's my devil's advocate for it, you know. No, I think I that know. makes sense. Yeah, uh, you know, because I mean, because Sansa does model a lot of the stuff she does after Cersei, because Cersei was kind of like her fucked up mentor, you know, like. Mm. <laughs> so well, yeah, I mean, like you said, she was trapped. She, that's all she had to focus on. Yeah, and like Cersei was like, maybe believe like she was helping Sansa. She's like, yeah, my son's horrible, but. You know, my husband was horrible. You're going to go through the same hell I did. Yeah, I so think you might as well get used to it. That's a good point. And Cersei's fucked up way. She probably does think she's helping. Yeah. <laughs> right. it, it would be interesting to get like a point of view um, before she thinks Sansa killed Joffrey or had something to do with Joffrey. Because after that, I mm -hmm. think, you know, that gets all tainted, like her view of, of her. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Because yeah. maybe she, maybe it was like the Kevin thing. Like I feel bad for, her, so I'm gonna help her out um, by <laughs> telling her. I, I don't know, you know, just kind of how Kevin was to Cersei, like how he felt bad for Cersei. But maybe it was good for Cersei to get whipped naked through the street, streets and totally shamed. Yeah, yeah, she's kind of like you know you need to learn your place because yeah. I have to learn my place and you'll just be better if you learn your place. Yeah, yeah, which yeah, just perpet perpetuates uh, mistreatment and abuse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, she's definitely a, a, a complex character with just you know horrible trauma because she is um, she is a woman that's had to put up with all of this stuff. Uh, from the society and from her terrible father, and then she just passes it right along. Yes, I, like I, she just continues that misogyny and 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 uh, aggression and and you know because she thinks that that's just you know what everyone should have to deal with. You know? Yeah, she had to deal with it, so everyone else should have to deal with it too. And you're never going to change anything, so let's all just drink. <laughs> and and we all know people like that that are just so malcontent and they've had other rough life or they've been treated a certain way and oh they yeah just turn yeah. and treat the other people uh that same way and right it's 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 really annoying and it's it's really terrible but yeah i mean but but yeah they just think like that's how i grew up i turned right. out just fine no th right. no mm -hmm. therapy for me and right <laughs> i got through it so yeah. I'm going to do the same, even though like, it's like, ah, <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, you need therapy. <laughs> yeah. like, um, so why do you think, why hasn't Lena Headey won an Emmy? <laughs> I don't know. I Probably. really don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm very okay. surprised by this. Like I, how many, how many villains how many people that play villains uh, <laughs> actually win em Emmys? Like, like mm -hmm. villains that people actually like, legitimately despise. Hmm. 
that's a fair point. I mean, I'm trying to think of like. I mean, I could take the easy way out, and it's probably true. I mean, she is a woman, and there is still uh, misogyny today in America. But you know, yeah, it seems. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make assumptions here, but it does seem strange, no. um, especially considering, you know. Peter Dinklage is fantastic. He's a great actor and he does great on that show, but there's been a couple seasons where he's been nominated and even won. And he's really not had a whole lot of material to work uh, with. So it seems it's... kind of strange that they would pass her over when she's had some of her strongest material. Yeah, that's know? a great point. It's it's almost like they're and again, Peter's a great actor, but it's almost like they're rewarding him for Boy, we really should have nominated him in season two, three, and four. Yeah, yeah. But now let's do it and honor I, him. And and that happens a lot in these award shows. I mean, I don't give a lot of credence to this stuff. It's like uh, it's like with uh, what's it? Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Like he won. He won. Didn't he win like a an Emmy for something? Uh. Or not probably an Oscar, an Oscar but, for the, something, but it was for a movie that I forget which one it was, but it it was good. I mean, he's good in everything he's yeah. in. Well, it's kind of like it wasn't it, the one I would have given him one for. Kind of like Martin Scorsese winning for The Departed, and The Departed is an amazing film, but Martin love that movie. should have won <laughs> long ago as best director, but finally. Um, it comes, you know, it comes along that here's a good movie. Mark Scorsese is nominated. Let's give it to him. We've never given it to him when yeah. he should should have won for Taxi Driver and a, and a ton of other films, and he just never won. It's kind of like that. That you know, yeah. okay, well now we have finally have an opportunity to award him. But back to the, I think you're kind of right, Brett. That protagonists. Or characters who are seen more like protagonists usually win these type of awards. Um, but women also like. I'm thinking of. I don't watch the show, but yeah, yeah. What's the show? There's like two shows on ABC, or they used to be on ABC. Um, Scandal and something else. They're made by the same person. But anyways, those – Carrie Washington and the other actress, I don't remember. They they were consistently winning there for a while, both women, hmm. both antagonists on these shows – or protagonists on these shows. Antagonists, I think, sometimes have a harder time. It, it's – it's it's you've – so so it's like – um. this is what my dad always said. He goes – he – and you know it kind of rubbed off on me it's like if if someone can play a villain and you physically want to like reach through the tv and strangle them you know like you just don't like they're just that good at like annoying you or or making you mad on television uh they're a great villain now if they're a villain that you're like oh i really like him as a villain like like no, that's not a good villain. <laughs> Cuz you like him. Like it's yeah. it's kind of and you know, not to speak I mean, I don't know. I love Heath Ledger and his Joker, but I I don't know. Like it I mean, it was great, but I would not consider him like one of the best villains of all time. Just well, just not I, one of the best villains, but it, it was a it, it was a great performance, performance. Was probably no, no. deserving. No, no, it was, it was very yeah. deserving. But like, but his yeah. death, obviously, I mean, yes, and it, all that was a major, yeah. a major consideration for why he was nominated and why he won posthumously. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe my beef is like, oh, he's the greatest Joker ever. It's like, well, he was great, but um, Mark Hamill, yeah, I, Mark Hamill is the great. <laughs> Mark Hamill's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. He is. He's pretty iconic. I mean, I still like Jack Nicholson. Yeah, yeah. and ja well, Jack Nicholson. Uh, you know, <laughs> I I could I think he's the best on screen. Um, but I, I just don't know why they don't just CGI Mark Hamill in a movie, and it'd be perfect. You know, just CG, just have an actor CGI his, you know, face or whatever, like they did with. They do that all the time now. So yeah. I was going to say Grand Moff Tarkin, but that apparently, you know, that that just didn't go well. So it was a bad example. 
I thought that worked pretty well, actually. I thought it did, but apparently everyone <laughs> else <laughs> that's seen that movie <laughs> just hated it. So I'm like, yeah. okay. <laughs> I think it's, well, okay, we're really off topic here. <laughs> yeah, I think no, it's the fact no. that he has such a prominent role yeah. in Rogue One. And so yeah. I think, I, I've heard other people say this, that, you know, I just didn't expect him to be on there that long. And I was like, I I want more Graham off target. I mean, he's a great character yeah um all right so back to cersei back to game of thrones <laughs> back to a song by some fire let's close <laughs> out let's close out and uh, josh you may have kind of answered this already with the hands of gold comment on the show why was the va- the show does this thing where they leave off parts of prophecies or the completely twist a prophecy and make their own like with house of the undying Mm -hmm. um which i I don't i don't remember which episode we talked about it brett but i really think the house of the undying in the show it's still strong it's still strong but it's also i think i think that's danny's end i think she's seeing the fact that she goes to the wall Mm -hmm. there's snow she's gonna die and you know, she has an afterlife where she's reunited with Kyle Drogo and her son, and you know, she's dead, but she lives yep. to an extent and, happily ever after. Yeah, if I if I can plug my yep. uh, my essay real quick, if you read that, you'll kind of get the same impression. That's kind of yep. the conclusion I was going towards as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's and and that's very strong. The 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 house of the undying in the show is very strong. The house of the undying in the books is also very strong, but it is like. Yeah, completely different. Here's you're gonna see Rob. Here's Rob Stark dying at the Red Wedding. Here's you're on Greyjoy on a ship. Here's uh, Stan Sparathian, um not casting a shadow, and you know all, all these things. Um, but why was the Valonqar? I mean, that everything like the whole Maggie the Frog prophecy is in there except for that last line about the Valonqar. Why was that left off? I think uh, if i had to guess i think it's just because of the way that jamie and Tyrion are kind of like fan favorites and they kind of changed their relationship um after or i guess right before tywin's death i don't remember where it was in the show but uh, they changed it like that that conversation was different in the show than it was in the books and in the books they walk away and they both hate each other um mm-hmm. but they didn't do that in the show and so like, they're both kind of looked at as good guys in the show whereas that's probably not the case in the books Mm. and so to have one of them come back i guess and kill cersei uh, i guess it could be a good guy versus bad guy situation but it might have just not been quite as i guess uh, maybe maybe a little bit too gray for tv so so i haven't um went back on season one like rewatch season one for a while but i can't remember who i heard this from but apparently with the danny prophecy on the show it never said anything about her not being able to have children that was just only in the books but for some reason they like they may have like the uh dan and dave may have uh accidentally forgotten about that about what's in the show and what's not and Mm -hmm. then danny mentions it in season seven that uh what's her name said um uh mary mazdor yeah mary mazdor said said something about that and you know you know john makes his remark about Mm because i think all that happens now i could be wrong because i it's been it's been a long time but, um, so I, and I'm definitely going to look this up so I can, uh, you know, if I'm wrong and this is just misinformation, I can, I'll correct or correct myself at the beginning of the next episode. But, but, um, yeah, so like she just had the abortion. There was no mention of her, uh, not being able to have children. It, it was the, you know, the, the whole other part of that prophecy that was mentioned in the show, um, had to do with Drogo, um, and Mm. the, and the, yeah. So 
I don't know. It, it was just another one of those prophecy things that um, got changed a little mm. bit for whatever reason. So I don't know. Um, Interesting. I don't. Yeah, I don't remember that. I'll have to go back and look at that because. Yeah. That, that would be interesting why it would be left off. Yeah. What's weird is, yeah. So by the time I heard, I, whoever said it, uh, by the time I heard that, I was like, well, it's been so long since I've watched season one and I read the books after season one. All I can remember is, yeah, that's a part of the prophecy. Mm -hmm. But um, apparently, maybe it, it, it wasn't in the show. So they left that out so i don't know yeah so um i i kind of think i think i think you're right josh that it, the valon car just brings up okay well what does that mean like then you have to add in okay valon car means this so you'd have to add us a, a through line or a storyline into season five when it's introduced about what does Valencar mean? Who is it directed at? Um, and I still think it probably should have been included. But I also like your idea that, and, and I know you're, you said you're kind of not really wedded to it, but I like your idea that the Hands of Gold could reflect that. Um, it might reflect it for Arya. Um, so... I'm not sure. I, I just don't. I just don't know why it was left off, um, since it's so important to the characterization of Cersei. Of course, as we've talked earlier, the show, the show could have said, "Well, we like Lena Headey. Cersei's a really interesting character. We're going to change her substantially and well, move her forward, and so we need to change this this arc of her to to make it." you know make it different so we can keep her around longer well i mean yeah. what if what if they thought it was just too obvious for whatever reason they're like oh let's just take that one off maybe maybe they had information we didn't you know i don't yeah, maybe. I, you know well, it's possible yeah i mean again we're not in our heads so we don't know that she can constantly worries about the fact that Tyrion or others are going to kill her so yeah I don't know. Just it's just interesting that it was left off. It'll it'll be very interesting to go back when the show ends, and then when the book series ends. Oh and my god! Overlay all this stuff. No, That's gonna that no. right there is going to like tie up fandom so, for like three years. So I don't know. I don't know. This has probably been pointed out before, but Tyrion literally choking Shay to death in the hand of the tower. Um. And then talking about the Valonqar wrapping the hands around the throat, you know, so that, I think that could be a foreshadowing. Yeah. Because the hand of gold, you know, like yeah. we're talking yeah. about. So, um, so there's, I don't know, like, it's just, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe George set it up like this, uh, you know, put the little clues in there to make us, uh you know uh wonder which one it's gonna be yeah yeah i think he does but then but uh, you know my favorite theory though is uh brianne you know brianne the beauty is the younger more beautiful uh queen to cast her down you know i i mean i don't know if she i don't think she's gonna be a queen but you know who knows she might, she might be jamie's queen yeah yeah he might, he might, he might, um, somehow, you know, say some offhand reference, like you're my queen of love and beauty and give her a flower or something. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, that's possible. Yep. All right. Anything else about Cersei Lannister gold symbolism? I don't think so. I think we covered most of it. We, we, I think we've been all over, all over the place here tonight. Great discussion. But a little bit. I hope. I hope it's. Uh, we're, a lot of it's my fault. I'm, I apologize. No, no, no. That's. <laughs> we we. Uh, I think we've had a lot of fun today, and I think we've hit on a lot of interesting points about Cersei um, and about gold uh, in general, and golden crowns, golden shrouds. All that's so important to Cersei's characterization. Um, so we hope you've enjoyed. Uh, today's show 
Um, Josh, again, remind the listeners, the fans out there where they can find you on, on social media. Yeah. So you can, um, you can find me on Twitter sometimes. Um, and, uh, I'm usually, uh, you know, I, I might be, you know, chiming in on a thread that LML has started or, or, uh, Jeff has started. Um, and, uh, usually I mean, they're just making jokes every now and then, or, you know, <laughs> some, some post. but, uh, occasionally I have, uh, more interesting things to add. <laughs> Thanks for listening again, Josh. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, check it. We should check it. Oh no, I was gonna say, Josh, you, you seem like you're about to pass out. <laughs> I, uh, I think we all are. It's like I think approaching hour three, uh, so we need to we need to wrap this up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for listening, and thanks to Josh for joining us again. Uh, you can find Planetos Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter at Planetos Podcast. Listen to our shows on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, YouTube, and other platforms that support the RSS feed. Email us. We want to hear from you. Email us at planetospodcast at gmail.com if you have questions or ideas. I've been one of your hosts, Travis. You can find me on Twitter at Sir underscore Travis. And I've been your other host, Brett. You can find me at Homely Pillow on Twitter and uh, rate and review us. You know, make sure to do that if uh, you haven't already. Uh, I've seen I've seen we had, you know, some some more ratings, which you know, it's nice, but we need more. Always more. No, no, we're, we're grateful for what we got, but you know, more is better. Uh, the outro song is, uh, what is, oh yeah. Smack by Bleach Garden. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You know, if y'all, if y'all are listening to me right now and, uh, the intro song is Jungo's ballad and that's by myself and general Re. Gen, not General Revis, and I know I said that in one of the episodes. General, I think I got okay. Uh, I, saw, Dylan I heard you Revis. say that one time, and I said, "Did he say General Grievous from Star yeah, Wars?" No, I think I got the names mixed, and I I listened to that the other day, and I was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> and and I didn't catch it and uploaded it. <laughs> That's crazy. That's funny. I, I said uh, Jungo's test one day for the intro <laughs> song. And the funny thing is, I wasn't wrong because that's what I had it named before. Because mm. so I made the song for like this um, Elder Scrolls server I was playing on. Yeah. Uh, Morwen. Yeah. I don't know. They made like this multiplayer like mod for it. And um, so, yeah, I made like this that or me and me and my uh, roommate or my old roommate made the song for uh the uh admin of the group who was named his name was jungo or his username was jungo so so it was like a tester song i we threw out to him so it was called uh jungo's test for a while hmm. and then i renamed it jungo's ballad for this podcast just so it sounded like a song you know <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little history lesson there, you know, on nice. that song. All right, but, um, but yeah, uh, bye. <laughs> bye. See you around Planetos. Planetos.